What's really good, everybody? This is Nathan Albach, and welcome to the podcast where we get into people's stories and go down a bunch of rabbit holes about what's really good in the world. And I'll tell you what's really good right off the bat. Um, it's really good to be back podcasting after a bit of a hiatus. For those of you who follow the show, you might know that I picked up a lot of freelance work these past few months, so I haven't had as much time uh, to record, which really sucks. And I've been saying this in the past few intros I've done, but I do plan to release more regular content soon, whether it's through this specific podcast or on a future Twitch channel. Uh, so stay tuned. It's all coming. I'm just constantly overfilling my plate. But enough about me. Uh, let's just jump into this thing. For today's episode, I had a tremendous time chatting with Dave Jorgensen, the man behind the Washington Post's iconic TikTok account. Uh, Dave also produces other shows for the Post, like uh, Department of Satire and Short Takes, which can both be found on YouTube or their website. I also learned afterward that he hosts his own podcast called Survivor Top 10, which recaps Survivor episodes. I, I, it's still on. Who knew? <laughs> well, I knew because my wife's obsessed with Survivor, which we get into on the show a little bit. Um, I, I got all that linked in the show notes, uh, along with a recent piece that featured him in The Atlantic, which was super cool. And uh, of course, a link to his Twitter account where he gives like behind the scenes commentary about his work, just similar to what I do. If you're into that, it's all good. If not, it's also all good. But uh, we took a deep dive into his background throughout this show, um, just how he got into TikTok last year, uh, what the process has been like personally and internally with his coworkers. We also ripped about the state of online media for a bit and got into the platform's culture at large, which is uniquely dominated by Zoomer humor, for those of you who don't know. <laughs> but it is continually expanding demographics more every day, including the uh, boomers like us. And I just read actually that it's closing in on a billion monthly users, which just for scale, uh, both Facebook and YouTube currently have around 2 billion monthly users. So it's just insane. It's already like half of that um, if it maintains this uh, level of growth. And plus, we uh, also talked about spam, Aaron Carter, and just overall why I now believe that uh, him and my wife were actually meant to be together. <laughs> So, uh, no, I'm, I won't spoil it anymore here. That's just, that's all you get. So please enjoy and uh, please rate the podcast on iTunes or wherever you have it if you dig it. Now let's get into what's really good. Dave, thanks for coming on the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm pumped. <laughs> Good. This is going to be a fun one. I've been wanting to do this since I met you at uh, the the conference, the Social Fresh conference. Good. Uh, just like when I met you, I drank like a whole thing of coffee just now, so I'm twitching. <laughs> so I'm getting Ready the real you, the real you that I met before. The real, yes, yes, the real me, which is uh, full of coffee, I suppose. That's the DC <laughs> me, too. Perfect. Oh, man, yeah. I... I D the DC life, I mean, you're right in the, the sort of epicenter of media and politics right now. I can't even imagine being down there this time in, in history. <laughs> it's so, you know, it, do, it doesn't even make, I, I don't think anyone is processing, you know, both as a country, but specifically in DC, what's going on. It's kind of like we all ran this marathon from 2015 to 2016. And then I could see a lot of people getting ready to take a breath and then, you know, the unexpected happened and Donald Trump got elected and everyone's like, oh, we're going to run the marathon again. And we've just been <laughs> right. doing it over and over again. And now we're like, it's another election. Like, I guess I'll run that marathon. So uh, yeah, everybody's it's... running on fumes at this point. Exactly. Yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah. It's um, it's a crazy time, crazy time to be alive, especially like working in journalism and media, yep. which I want to get into with you throughout this whole conversation, just because I feel like specifically what you do doing these TikToks for the Washington Post is such a interesting sort of intersection between the sort of new age internet 
advertising marketing world and like trying to relate to young people but then at the same time you're also trying to not just preserve uh, a media institution and publication but try to like make it relevant and appealing to young people so like was this whole thing your idea or like like how how did this whole thing come to be i guess from the from the get-go yeah, it was it was my idea for better or worse. Uh, I think they say for better now, but uh, you know when I pitched it, they're like, <laughs> I, "Yeah, okay. it's safe to say." I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I I I think back in March, I really wanted to pitch it. I didn't even really know the platform yet. I just understood um, like how it worked. I di- I didn't even fully understand the culture at that point or all the different. Especially, I didn't know all the memes. I just kind of looked at it and I said, "Okay, this." works for everything that I'm good at. And, you know, I'm not good at a lot of things, but I'm good at editing and writing short bits. And I was like, this, this plays to my strengths. So Mm. I kind of pitched it on that. And I'd been at the post at that point, almost two years. So I'd I'd built enough trust where, you know, I wasn't just this new guy coming in, like we should do TikTok. And uh, it was a little (laughs) bit, you know, there's at least some understanding that I knew what I was talking about. And I was lucky enough that uh, another one of my coworkers, Teddy Amenbar, um, who works on social, the actual social team. I don't work on the social team. Uh, he kind of came in that meeting with me because I asked him to, because he has been on TikTok and is still on TikTok and is obsessed with it. And so he could answer all the really hard questions that they had that I didn't know the answer to yet. Right. Uh, yeah. So yeah, definitely my baby from the beginning. What did you do for um, Washington Post before all this? Then were you just like in video production with them? Yeah, I was hired on the what what we now call the creative video team, uh, but even at the time it didn't have a name. It was basically just early 2017. They announced not only in video but all across the company just a bunch of new positions. Mm-hmm. Uh, probably the most people they'd hired in a in that sort of group in a long time. And so there's this new creative video team, and now there's about 10 of us on it. And I was the first person hired to the post. There was already one other person there. And um, I basically was hired as writer editor. And I came, I, the person that hired me was my boss in my old job and she kind of knew what I, what I'm about and what kind of stuff I like to do. And so very quickly I started doing political satire videos. I did sort of the series, which I still do from time to time called short takes where I interview kids on the street about anything. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's sort of like YouTube kids say the darndest things, the art link letter <laughs> one, not, not, not the other one. And, uh, and so it, it's, you know, I was doing that for a couple of years with some exceptions where I would help other people with their projects because everyone on my team runs different series. Uh, like someone, she does, she did this series called Should I Freeze My Egg? So I helped a lot with that one. There's another series where this person is Throwback Thursday, and I, I just helped with a lot of people. Yeah, that's cool. So before getting hired there, then, like, what, what was kind of your background getting this? Amanda, you, you mentioned, like, this is kind of a specific skill set you have for doing skits and, and editing and all that. I mean, were you doing video production or comedy prior to all this? Because you seem like a pretty natural personality as far as, like, not just being able to put the skits together, but just owning that that limelight in a way. Yeah, I think I, I'd like to think of my – well, I don't like to think. I, I think, unfortunately, I was never quite natural at it. I just did it so much that it comes off more natural mm, okay. now. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I just am so extroverted in that way where I like to make people laugh. And so that's where the, everything sort of stems from. Like uh, in college, I – all I wanted to do was was be was work for a late show, and I knew that I could get this internship at Colbert Report because people at my school had previously gotten that, and that's like the reason I went to the school I went to, DePaul, mm. um, was I knew about this internship, which is crazy. Uh, I'm glad I did it, but in retrospect, like that internship was not guaranteed at right, all. Right, right. <laughs> uh, so that was great that that worked out. Uh, but so once I was at Colbert, and that was 2012, um, it was during the presidential election. And it was so much fun uh, watching what they, how they just took the news in every single day and how they reacted to it. And I just kind of started to enjoy politics in that way. By the time I left, I realized like how much I knew about what was going on uh, just politically in the country, which I'd never at all been in even like somewhat aware of what was going on. So, uh, <laughs> and so I just, you know, from then politics just became something that was really interesting to me and really funny to just poke at, uh, my sort of like class clown instincts came in and I just, uh, within a, a year after school, I was already in DC cause a friend of mine, uh, 
was already here and and he was a friend from college that I did this late show with uh, at college. It was it was called the pre recorded late night show, and we had it was like SNL meets sort of how late night is now with digital shorts and all right. these. But but I but I also had a desk and I would interview teachers and like the lunch lady and like all these different, just, it didn't really matter. We would just interview someone and <laughs> really weird stuff. We did like an Oprah style episode uh, where we just had someone make a really big sandwich and then we just cut it up and threw out sandwiches and said, everyone oh gets a sandwich. <laughs> uh, we did all kind. it was, it was honestly, it was, it was really fun and creatively uh, it was like, the the best thing that could have happened to me, especially as I was about to leave college, and I spent more time on that than any of my classes. I was going to say uh, it, it sounds like the the road was truly paved to to come to this point with TikTok. Yeah, yeah, it really was. It, it's and I never would have expected it. I didn't even expect it until you know March of this year that I started to see like oh this this works for me. Uh, and not to say that TikTok's the end all be all, but it's certainly uh, something that right now I'm obsessed with. Um, and so. Yeah, my friend that I did that late show with, he went out to D.C. and he's working for this really small site called IJR, or at that time it was called IJ Review, uh, which was conservative leaning. And he's like, they want you to uh, to run the humor based website on this conservative lean site. And I was like, I don't, I don't know how that works. Like, yeah. people like to joke, like, oh, you know, conservatives can't be funny, but there's kind of a little bit of truth to that, I think. Um, but I like the challenge. Uh, <laughs> I like, I really, and honestly, it was a great challenge to basically create this site that had to appeal to anyone from libertarians to what, what would become Trump voters. Mm -hmm. And I was, by the time Trump was elected, like I had known for two or three years what a Trump voter might look like. And I already knew where the party was going because I had been trying to make those people laugh for three right, years. Right. <laughs> So it was actually – it became an asset pretty quickly, though it was really difficult. And while we were there, they kind of merged the humor site into I, what became just IJ.com. And then we started making just basically videos all the time. Um, and they we started doing ones with presidential candidates. Uh, the one we did first that was like uh, – probably the the most popular from that time was Lindsey Graham smashing his cell phone. <laughs> uh, and it was when Donald Trump gave out Lindsey Graham's phone number at a rally. Right. And, <laughs> and the next day we're like, actually that night, someone on our team called one of his people they knew and was like, Hey, do you want to like just smash your phone on camera for us? He goes, okay. Perfect. And so we had that video done by noon the next day. And it's so crazy. That was four and a half years ago. And Lindsey Graham is completely pristine the perception of him is the opposite now it's it's so strange like he hated trump both privately and publicly then and so uh it's it's crazy how time how yeah there was a lot of that flip-flopping on like conservative media even like even just on fox in general just like the general conservatives well, yeah oh, and I'm, so, I'm sorry to keep interrupting no, you're, good. you're good it's there's a little bit of a delay it's fine okay, okay. <laughs> fair enough uh so that that actually that kind of led to the demise of our site in some ways was because there was no real identity. Um, the, the site I worked for, the, the political news was leaning right, but it was kind of leaning center right. Mm. And they like quickly couldn't really thrive in this new Trump age. And the site started to collapse. Everyone that I worked with started going everywhere else. Um, like pretty much half the people that started Axios were my former coworkers. Um, and they all just jumped ship there. A lot of people went to CNN. And, and by the end of it, I was it was basically like me and my buddy Colin, the guy who got me hired from college. And we were like the two left on the raft. <laughs> like <laughs> the ship had sunk a long time ago. And Colin was like, I'm just going to quit. <laughs> oh, man. And then I, I kind of laid on the raft a little longer until I found rescue at the Washington Post. Uh, but he, don't worry. He got a job at Axios not long after that, too. So, <laughs> so it's it a all, happy ending. Yeah, all of it's a happy ending. Everyone I worked with there was honestly great. And they all had their own happy endings because that company just hired 22-year-olds out of college that would you know work for any you know paycheck. And they just happened to hire a lot of people that were really smart and really good at what they do. So mm -hmm. that was that was a really good experience in retrospect. It's all it's crazy too. Just like listening back to you, kind of lead up to all this and how your background and kind of your your introduction almost to the political satire or whatever that world, like the sort of Stephen Colbert late night world, and then kind of getting into it's like poking fun and like with the memes and and sort of uh, immersive videos in comedy that that surrounds politics today. It's just interesting. In how 
most people, I mean, there's, there's obviously like massive audiences for prestigious publications like the Washington Post or the New York Times or the Atlantic or Wall Street Journal or whatever. Like they, they've always had their audiences and I'm sure they always will to some extent. But you and I both know from kind of growing up on the Internet that there's also mass, mass demographics of people, not just kids, but just people in general who, especially today with access to the Internet, they don't really are they're not interested in politics in like a serious way where they're reading long form pieces on the Atlantic or, you know, waiting for these really serious segments that are analyzing foreign policy or whatever. Like they're getting their bits and their information from people like John Oliver or, you know, some like sat- satire news person who just does bits, whether it's on Twitter or YouTube or whatever. So it's interesting how like you kind of experience that intersection a bit going into the Washington Post, which isn't really, I mean, it's a much more prestigious platform than, say, like a late night show. But you're kind of right. bringing in that newer, uh, almost like a necessity, because like you and I both know, I mean, I'm sure some of the people there pushed back. And I'd be interested to hear like what your experience was like in the <laughs> beginning there, because uh-huh. we both know that, yeah, obviously, there's a massive difference between the late night type comedy, political commentary or whatever, and then the more prestigious media institutions. But at the same time, like, they're reaching completely different audiences. So you get to kind of bridge the people between them in some way. So, like, I don't know, did you get to communicate that vibe at all, like, to the people you were working with when you were trying to, like, pitch this and explain it? Or, like, what was your experience, if that wasn't accurate at all? Yeah, <laughs> I, no, my no that was... You, no, <laughs> your, take is, your take is accurate. Uh, the, the, only, the only edit I would make to it is that, uh, and we'll get into that part later, but the reception was has been mostly positive. I would say, like, almost overwhelmingly positive in a way that uh, is almost unexpected. Just from what we've done so far uh, within my coworkers at the post, but uh, bringing it back, I think, you know, I, I mentioned that the sort of two years I'd been there already, the way that we would justify things then is we'd be like, you know, even just the satire page was a, was really hard to pitch mm-hmm. because we actually pitched it as its own separate YouTube channel called Department of Satire. And they were really resistant, resisting to it at first, but we kind of were like, hey, satir- satirical cartoons have been part of the newspaper since Ben Franklin you know, wrote that join or die snake. And he was trying to get people to, uh, join the union. Like it's something that's existed for an extremely long time. Um, and video is just the next version of it. Uh, it it was, it was especially helpful that we could point to her block. who was the cartoonist for the post for 60 years and won like multiple Pulitzers. There you go. Certainly, we're not going to win a Pulitzer from TikTok unless they <laughs> very quickly change the descriptions of the categories. Um, but that was enough to be like, OK, satire, political satire especially has a place here at the Post. And so by the time I, I pitched TikTok, it wasn't that hard to make sort of the second leap into, uh, you know, TikTok is actually something really relevant. And and also I was brought on to bring in younger audiences. I, I sort of I didn't mean to admit that earlier, but part of the creative video team's main goal was to bring in millennials and and Gen Z and all that, because, you know, the post still has a pretty strong subscriber base, but it's it very heavily leans towards peoples in their in their 40s, 50s and 60s. Right, right, right. Totally. Yeah. And I I remember reading somewhere that you had mentioned the whole bit about the political cartoons, but I think it's such an important point because when looking at a lot of these sort of new experimental areas of, of marketing and advertising for media, I mean, it is a brand new landscape. I mean, we're like we're in uncharted territories in a way. So it's helpful to be able to parallel like what's going on right now to things that we've experienced in the past, because I've, I've seen a couple people, not just through your uh, like interviews that you've done, but just in general online, talk about this type of marketing or whatever, and they'll say like, uh, it, it kind of trivializes the news or the institution of journalism. It kind of makes it feel like it's less serious. But to yeah, to what you're saying there, I mean, this is something that's always been tied in to these institutions in some way. Like maybe not like when you look at even just like the New York Times or whatever, it's not like every single piece is this like super serious long form. I mean, there's opinion pieces, there's cartoons, right. there's all these different legs to that institution. So it sounds like you've thought plenty about this as you've gone on. 
<laughs> yeah, and I've had to because, you know, uh, as you could guess, I've I've had to explain myself to a number of people, both inside and outside the building, uh, and why we're doing it. And you kind of hit on one of the main things I usually say, was, which is that, you know, the politics section of the Washington Post is like one-fifth of the actual newspaper we mm-hmm. produce every day, if, if less. So uh, there's a lot of people uh, to highlight in our newsroom, too, that uh, – that we do on TikTok almost every day. So that was another big part of the pitch was like, I'm going to be showing everyone in our newsroom and what they actually do. And if you actually, you know, look at the platform, you'll see where I'm commenting and replying on our own videos about who this person is and what they do. And, uh, you know, while it all seems very silly at times, and certainly we make very silly TikToks, um, <laughs> the, the integrity is still there, uh, in my opinion. And I feel pretty strongly about this, that I, I've never, li- it's not like I'm posting, you know, fake news or uh, everything we write that's uh, about a story that's going on. I basically have taken it directly from one of our Washington Post articles. So uh, the integrity still exists in terms of like we're not lying to people by any means, but you know we are certainly being kind of having actual fun in the newsroom. And uh, I'm of the opinion that's a good thing that people should be smiling. <laughs> and, totally, uh, totally. Yeah. <laughs> how did how did you initially? <laughs> I'm just I'm so interested in this whole bit about you collaborating with everybody in the newsroom. I think it's easily yeah. my favorite part of yeah. all the TikToks you do. Because at first when I started scrolling through, I'm like, oh, it's cool. Like he collaborated with this department or whatever. That's sweet. And then as I'm going through, I'm like, holy! Like he's literally collaborating with like everybody at this company. So, I mean, like how are, are there people with different opinions? Like, do some people not want to have their face shown? Like how, how is that whole collaboration process like with uh, your coworkers? Um, so, well, can I explain to you first how I sort of, how I thought, or... No, you're not allowed, Dave. You're not allowed. <laughs> <Can I? laughs> Please. Am I allowed to share uh, my feelings? <laughs> uh, so I, let me, I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I need to explain how my own thought process works. And, and to do that, I, it requires explaining the extremely uh, nerdy part of myself. But I don't mean that in a self-deprecating way. I'm very proud of this. I, I'm obsessed with the show Survivor. I still am. Uh, it's coming up on <laughs> season 40. Uh, uh, you should have married my wife. This is, <laughs> she married oh, the wrong tall bearded guy. <laughs> we, uh, uh, that's funny you say that because my wife in the other room right now has watched maybe one episode with me and she's just like, I don't, I don't really get it. But anyway, uh, <laughs> I, I love Survivor. I'm obsessed with it. I, I podcast about Survivor. That's why I had this podcasting mic. Um, and I, 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 not as good as your mic. So, you know, oh, but, stop. uh, yeah. Gosh. Uh, but uh, I, I love Survivor because uh, uh, basically for the strategy, it used to be about the survival part and it still is to a small extent. But now it's much more about strategy and how you approach people and how you sort of uh, build alliances. And I kind of have liked thinking of all this as sort of uh, in getting endorsements and alliances from other people. So I was very strategic about who I approached first to be in TikToks. Um, I knew that David Farenthold would do it. And, you know, obviously he's one of the most recent Pulitzer winning reporters in our newsroom. He's very well respected. And I knew he would say yes. So re- very early on, I got him in a TikTok. I got Wes Lowry, another Pulitzer prize winning, uh, person in a TikTok. Um, I got, uh, Robin Gavon, who's our fashion reporter who everyone is obsessed with and they should be. And so I knew that by putting these people in TikToks and having their, I mean, their faces there and then publishing it to Twitter, which was the biggest part of the strategy, uh, that I would start everyone else would start saying yes. And the Twitter part especially was really important because, you know, we do have a Slack channel at the Washington Post, but basically people find out about the Post through Twitter because, as you know, D.C. in general and politics, they're all just very, it's just one big cesspool. Yeah, everybody knows each other and yeah. Yeah. And so just by posting on the Twitter, I knew that it would get some sort of outside momentum from that. And so it's funny because you you do get the momentum from TikTok, but Twitter itself has actually propelled it more and actually kind of given me job security as far as my job with making TikToks uh, because all the public support on Twitter makes – you know, makes my bosses, everyone feel comfortable about us being on TikTok. And we also got Marty Barron on a TikTok probably like the third week in. And that was huge. Yeah. Um, and the thing about the, the one with Marty is I think it's hilarious. Not a single person on TikTok understood it. The whole joke was that there was that Liev Schreiber was in the newsroom and we were really excited about it, but it was just Marty Barron. And Lee, basically Liev Schreiber played Marty Barron in the movie Spotlight. So like that <laughs> joke went over every single person's head on TikTok and every single person on Twitter got the joke from DC. I was going to say you're 
expecting like the Zoomers to know journalists and yes, <laughs> yeah. There's no way I knew it wouldn't work. It didn't work at all. They were the pe- the only reason people must have liked it is I don't know our perf- our convincing performance. I, I'm not really sure. <laughs> but well, on uh, that on that note, real quick, like have you? I'm just interested. Obviously, you've seen success from posting the TikToks to Twitter, but have you seen or talked to anybody specifically about? people who have specifically downloaded TikTok because of you, like when you post TikToks through and they're like, oh, I wasn't on TikTok before. Like now I'm going to join because I've seen yeah, your stuff. For sure. I get that. I get a tweet or, or message of probably two or three times a week now that someone will say basically exactly that. Like I downloaded TikTok because of these. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, it's funny. Sometimes they'll come back later and they'll be like, I think I made a mistake, but I'll still follow you. <laughs> And honestly, totally fine because what they always – that part of that sentiment is they're like, but I still want to follow your content. So yeah, they want I, to support I, you. Yeah. Yeah. So that's – that by itself is Sorry great. to interrupt. Yeah. I thought that was – yeah, just one one room. Yeah. No, that's great. Uh, and yeah, so I mean just – there's that overall strategy. But in terms of the reactions of people, um, it's really been – very positive. I, every so often we will shoot a TikTok and someone appears in the background. Uh, for example, I, I won't say this person's name because I completely respect this colleague and I understand why they wouldn't want to be in it. But a colleague was in the background of a TikTok and it actually was really funny the moment they appeared. Uh, and so I wanted to include it and I showed them. They're like, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it was all it was, yeah it sucked but it was like i completely get it totally and totally that happens one in a hundred times actually so it really wasn't a big deal but it, that's all to say that people aren't even negative about it at the worst they're just like no i don't want to be in it so yeah, and you got to respect that i mean so like, yeah. it's up there forever and just <laughs> yeah and you know i i think one thing and i've said this before uh you know, and other like little interview things. But uh, I, I really want the TikTok account to to reflect the Washington Post newsroom. And the newsroom is like really very dorky, funny, but very like people have a really good sense of humor. Uh, our video team sits right next to sports and sports is just like there's one person there. Uh, she was just in a TikTok. She was in the the fish joke TikTok where I I told her a joke and she covers her face in her hands. Cindy, uh Boren, and she is just constantly just like yelling at no one. She'll just like say something out loud and just laugh to herself, and it's the best. <laughs> and I haven't been able to capture that moment on like my phone yet, but uh, it, it, there's just a lot of like movement in the newsroom as you'd expect, but also just a lot of personalities, and so it's great that people actually get to see that. Yeah, it definitely comes through in all the TikToks. I'm always so impressed. It, it literally feels sometimes where I'm like, are these? Did they take acting classes or something? Like some of the people are so just naturally funny and enthusiastic about what's going on, which is, ob- which kind of just immediately negates the question I had before, which is, it's obvious that people are excited to be in them. Like no one, no one in the videos looks like they're being forced to be there, and if they do, it's like on purpose. Like they're acting, and it's very clear that they're acting. Like what is going on right now? <laughs> right. Yeah. And you know, I, I. Well, first of all, everyone's very positive because I think that's. Uh, the leadership of the company. I think Marty Baron himself is very good at uh, encouraging people to try new and exciting things. That's why I felt I could pitch TikTok in the first place. But I think also, you know, bringing it back, like my previous job, I learned a lot about egos and, and everyone has an ego. I have an ego. You have an ego. Like just how to work with different people and making sure that they feel like they are uh, contributing and that you're it, like that I'm not the star of the show or if they don't want to be the star, that, like just feeling right about their appearance in the TikTok and the level of uh, attention they're going to get, because that's just that's something you have to think about, unfortunately, or fortunately, just it's just does that make sense what I'm saying? No, like, absolutely. To, oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. That, that ties exactly in what I was thinking while you were explaining all that. I wanted to ask you in the process then of collaborating with your coworkers. I mean, obviously, you're at the helm editing these videos and like coming up with the skits, but like, is there a process where you collaborate the ideas themselves with your coworkers or is the idea something that you come up with, you flesh it out and then you're kind of like directing people, you know what I mean? Like, or, or yeah. are they like, or is sometimes do you come across someone who has that stronger ego and is like, I'm thinking this, like, what if I did this? Like, are you kind of collaborating in that way or is it more like you have a vision and you're like, Hey guys, like let's execute this and here's how we're going to do it. Yeah, I would say ninety uh, percent of the time when someone says I want to try this or I have this TikTok idea, I I'll just do it, and I'll and I'll ba- and I, we always kind of agree like let's do it your way and let's do it with the way I was thinking. And I honestly like fifty percent of the time it 
it, well, it goes either way, you know, mm-hmm. every other time, like it really, so that's, and the reason I think we can do that is because TikToks are honestly, because TikToks are 15 seconds. So, uh, it allows me to be like, you know, we can just reshoot this part. It's going to take literally seven seconds. So right, right. that, that helps a lot. Um, but I, yeah, in general, that's the part, uh, where I have to keep myself most in check. So I, at one point created this TikTok Slack channel where people can post their ideas at any point at any time. And that was so great because because people, you know, are constantly putting ideas in there. I told anyone, if you have like a really big idea, just email me. And so everyone, uh, can contribute ideas to a point where I always have like sort of a backlog of different TikToks we can do it. And I think most of the time we end up doing at least a version of a TikTok someone wanted to be in. That's awesome. Um, I love that. Yeah. And I, and I realized really quickly that, uh, a variety of people on TikTok is like, anytime I can bring in a new person in the newsroom that wants to be in a TikTok, it, that TikTok does well Based, I pretty much every time I keep saying 90%, but it's true. Like it really is like everything on TikTok is just so leaning towards uh, positive And even in that way, where like a new person, they're interested, they want to know who this is. And the best thing about the post is I have like 400 more coworkers who still haven't been to TikTok. Oh my God. So there's endless so many content. <laughs> endless content. The content farmer's dream. I'm interested to know, like, just generally when you went into this whole thing, I mean, obviously there's a learner's curve for anybody who joins a new platform like this. You have to kind of spend time figuring out what the culture is like and, and how you ought to be on it and everything. But for you specifically, I mean, you kind of developed this persona, which from meeting you, it feels similar to me, at least in my job with Stakem and the other brands I manage. Like, I get the opportunity to largely be myself, like not 100% obviously, but I can kind of project my personality into the brands I work with. And it feels, for meeting you in real life and even talking to you now, it feels like your real personality is similar to this persona, but it also has that kind of like dad edge almost, or like you're like kind of goofy. It's like you're a boom, you're not even a boomer, like you're a, a millennial person who knows you are seen as a boomer to zoomers yeah. so you're trying to like balance your perception yeah. by being like light so like how, how did you go about i guess developing that and how do you see yourself operating on the platform like amidst the kind of the culture of zoomers you sort of described it better than i have honestly uh, it's everything is heightened so yeah like i i thought everything down to um how the profile was built i was i created the tiktok profile as if I were a boomer. Mm -hmm. So that's why it says, you know, instead of it saying Washington Post in our title, it says we are a newspaper because I thought it would be funnier (laughs) if... You know, if a boomer is logging a TikTok, they don't know what they're – they're just writing the description. Like they're not thinking about – basically like I've accidentally put we are a newspaper. That was right. the joke. That was the reason I put that. Um, but now it's and also then, kind of ironic. So like it feels yeah. like it could be either way. <laughs> it does. It works on so many levels. And I love when people save the video because, it, you know, every TikTok at the end, it has that – your profile and it just says we are a newspaper, which is so funny. <laughs> it's great. Just to see that at the end of, uh, at, you know, 144-year-old newspaper. Anyway. Um, so there's that. And then, um, I, I just, yeah, I, I basically like to act like I'm a boomer. I like to, there was one other part of the profile. I can't remember that I did. That was, Oh, uh, the following, uh, I only followed two people. One is an account called New York times, but it's clearly just a kid from, I don't know where. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, um, so good. and I just, that was everything I was like, Oh, if I was like a boomer on Twitter, I would, I might follow the wrong account that says NY times, but it's clearly just some kid. Right. And about, about every two weeks still, I'll comment on his pro on the one video he has and say, follow me back. Like, Hey, how are you? Like, I'll be very, <laughs> I, I try to emulate what I've seen on Facebook before where, you know, you see someone who's like commenting on a picture and has nothing to do with the picture. Right. So, uh, I try to do that a lot. Um, and the other person we follow is Ashton Kutcher. If it is Ashton Kutcher, he's not using the profile. There's no videos. He doesn't have many followers. Most of the followers this account has now is because we follow it. Um, because I was thinking, like, if if I was a boomer who was trying to be really cool, I might have looked up Twitter early days and realized – And you, I don't know if you remember this, but, like, Ashton Kutcher yeah, was, yeah, like, like 2009 or something, right? Yeah, so I was like, oh, this person would think Ashton Kutcher would also be really into TikTok early on. <laughs> You thought so deep about that. Yeah. This. Yeah. That's not more deeper about that than I do about most of our videos. But oh, I, I that's great. Like, yeah. So very much that. And, and you basically described it. Like, yeah, clearly I'm a millennial. I'm I'm twenty eight years old, but like clearly uh I like 
I don't know. I, I just, I just want that. I want it to be heightened. I want it to be, do you remember like when you were 13 and like the 15 year olds in high school looked like they were 40? Yes. Like I, so I, I like to think of it that way. Like if I was 15 right now and I saw 28 year old me, I'd be like, Oh, that guy's like probably 44. Like yeah. I wouldn't know. <laughs> I'd have no idea. So, uh, My wife's constantly reminded me of this in public because there's so many times like some teenager will, I don't know, like yell something on the street and I think it's funny and I want to interact with them. And she'll right. be like, babe, like you have to remember you're the creepy old guy now. And I'm just like, yeah. ah, like I keep forgetting. Like, <laughs> and certainly the beard helps, you know, like you have a fantastic beard and and I, <laughs> I have a, a pretty good beard. I don't, I'm not brave enough to grow it as long as you do. But, uh, the, the one time while we're just on the, our, our wife's conversation, <laughs> the one time I've shaved it when I've even known my wife, she was like, you have to grow. Like, I don't even want to see you for a week. <laughs> <laughs> she was so, because I look, I lose about you know, like eight years at least. So well, maybe uh, you need to do that just for TikTok. Like I've just... thought about it, trust me, but <laughs> I still think about that moment where I still believe that she was like, I might leave you. Yeah, <laughs> the marriage was holding on by a thread. Just <laughs> yeah, or by a couple hairs. But uh, <laughs> how dare you? <laughs> I dare you. <laughs> oh man, no, that's like that's so true though. I mean, it, absolutely. Because I feel the exact same way navigating the platform where I just feel so old, even though obviously I know I'm not and I work on social media for a living. So I spend so much time still like consuming content from younger creators, just trying to keep up with things. But to a certain point, I mean, you literally can't. And then even if you try to unironically, you are then like fulfilling the boomer prophecy of just becoming like the try hard who's their time is up. And now the kids get to make fun of you. So you kind of have to find that like weird, like, I, I don't know what the guy's That's name exactly is. exactly right though. But it's le- it's leaning into it. It's leaning into just being yeah, a boomer. Exactly. Post it. Yeah. And you might, you might know the guy, um, he's a pretty popular TikToker. I, I forget his name, but he's like gotta be in his forties, maybe his fifties. And he always wears like a baseball cap and kind of like hip, like Nikes or nice shoes. And he always has like a basketball or something. And he does like the little dance moves where he throws the ball and catches it. And I, I haven't seen this, but I'm, oh, I'll I'll send this guy to you. I, I, I don't okay. follow him, but I see his stuff on the for you uh, page once in a while. And uh-huh. he's clearly like he's older and he's trying to be cool, but he knows that it comes off ridiculous and corny. So he just right. like plays into that, and it like the sort of self awareness makes it funny, and like the kids enjoy it because of that. Like they wouldn't enjoy it if he was like being dead ass serious like i'm really trying to be cool with these hip dances so that's it's, it's an interesting line that people like you and i have to be walking while we're trying to be relevant but at the same time like acknowledging we literally can't be relevant to a bunch of teenagers or like kids in their early 20s yeah and i and i think that like you know the basically i would say probably millennials like i think you and i have a really good sense of like bullshit on the internet but like gen z really has a great bs detector um of like who is being genuine and who is not yeah. and i think when you're sincere in your awareness of yourself like when you're self aware they get it and they're okay with it like when you're that guy who's you know trying to be a little bit jokingly trying to look younger with his Nikes and the basketball, or if you're me and I'm like acknowledging that I, I don't know what's going on <laughs> or I'm trying to be a Visco girl or whatever's hat. Like they, they respond to that much more than someone who's actually just trying to uh, blend in like very seriously. Like, you know, the, the, what was the story that came out today with the, uh, the former TikToker who made up a fake account. That's clearly him. Uh, and he's now given all the assets to it. Oh, I, I, don't, I don't think I saw the story. Um, it's, it's worth looking up. I'll, I'll look it up later for you, but uh, he's, he now goes by Troy and it's clearly the same person, but he's been pretending that he's, he's a 24 year old now pretending to be a 16 year old that just happens to look exactly like him. Oh, he's created this whole storyline where now he's pretending to be a 16 year old kid. And it's, it's creepy in a lot of ways, but uh, it, it, that's exactly like everyone saw right through it. Yeah. There was YouTube. Everyone was just like, this guy's an idiot. We know what's going on. So I think when you uh, are much more clear about what your intentions are, they, they respond to that much more. Yeah, totally. I mean, so when you look at the, the broader culture of tech, tech talk, I mean, obviously anytime there's, new trends going on and there, there's new dances and, and new songs that are kind of being memed on the platform and all that. But do you have any specific 
creators or channels or, or just sources that you go to for inspiration or just understanding all this since it is constantly changing? Or do you just kind of rely on your own like wit I, and then following the for you page? Yeah, it's it's the latter, but it, not because I don't like I, I would love to go down that rabbit hole every single day mm. and, and get in, and I certainly get inspired by specific people's TikToks, but that's through the for you page. Right. right. Uh, I think if I like really got into one account or a few accounts, our account wouldn't seem original anymore. So I, I just very I, I have to kind of like take my foot off the gas pedal and just kind of go into a room by myself and think about what I want to make that day. And then uh, if I see a TikTok that has a really cool sound or like a cool idea, I'll try to apply that to whatever the story I'm trying to tell that day. But I don't I, I try not to form our personality of the TikTok around. No, that's TikToks. that's super smart, especially because like I've, I've noticed this. I've only been on the platform for like three weeks, three weeks this week, but it's insane this isn't a unique problem to TikTok per se, but it is crazy how often there's just blatantly stolen content. All right. over, like not not just like trends, because obviously if there's a dance trend or whatever, like people might do similar skits or similar dances. But I mean, people will just straight up rip exact concepts, exact skits, or like rip old vines that like went viral five years ago and that kids yeah. today like didn't see, so they think it's new and original, and it's so weird because like a lot of that is still new to me like i'll see a tiktok and be like oh this is really funny look through the comments and there's like 10 people being like you stole this like credit this person so then it's like shoot i mean like there's it is really tough to be trusting i guess of the sort of creators on there i'm like what you can even use to inspire content because a lot of it's just like ripped or stolen or you just don't know where it's come from unless it's from like a reliable creator yeah, and it, it is tough, but I do. You did hit on the one thing I really appreciate about it, which is there's a lot of like sort of self policing, where like a lot of the community of TikTok itself will com like you just have to check the comment section to know if it's not an original idea, or go to the see you know sometimes the original sound is in the corner and you can find the original video, or right. I, it's it's very it, it's people shouldn't be copying each other, obviously, but I think better. It, it's caught quicker than it is on other platforms or has been caught. Totally, totally. I, I literally just posted, uh, it was yesterday, the day before on my Twitter, just how like it's insane, not just with this example, but just generally speaking, how positive the platform is. And like mm-hmm. I've been kind of ex- just going all over it. I mean, I've just gone through what I guess would be like the extreme sports type parts of TikTok or like the stunt parts of TikTok and obviously the dance stuff is everywhere. There's like all and there's like food stuff. There's a lot of obviously comedy skits I and mean, there's tons of different sort of subcultures within the broader culture of TikTok. But like pretty much everywhere that I've seen at least, the comment sections are overwhelmingly positive and there is a lot of that keeping people in check and kind of supporting each other, which I'm just not used to seeing as much on other platforms, especially working on Twitter where it's just like a constant cesspool of like, who are we canceling today? So, oh I mean, my like, god! Have you, have, do you feel the same way, or do you feel like course. Do you see something else? Like I don't. I, I'm so no, no, new no. to it, so I just I'm just interested to know like what you think about the community. I thought for a long time I was being sort of like doe-eyed or you know a little bit too optimistic about it, but mm-hmm. I still see just almost at least in our comments on our videos almost entirely positive comments. You know, I think if you haven't done anything to draw, you know, people towards you that are. Uh, whatever, want to, want to troll you or something, then it, they're really, it's just not going to happen as much. Very early on, we had this guy who would just constantly comment on every video, um, about something he didn't like about the Washington post. And, and I actually, I was, I was listening to one of your earlier podcasts where you're talking about how you kind of, I don't, I don't know how you described it, but you killed them with kindness. And that's exactly what I do where you yeah. kind of like respond to them and, and, by us responding to them in a way that is very positive, or I would actually do it in a very, what I, I, another going with the boomer, uh, sort of persona, I would respond as if I didn't understand they were making fun of us. Oh. I, <laughs> Just totally so like, sincere, like totally sincere. Yeah. And I still did that. I'll, I'll, but I don't get him as much anymore, but I would just very sincerely, like, you know, someone would call it the, the Washington compost and I'd be like, no, 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 it's Washington post, but you're really close. Like, <laughs> 
And, and so just by doing that, everyone else likes our comment. They, they kind of shit on the other guy. <laughs> right. And then he sort of slowly fades away. And sometimes they, you know, like you were saying, uh, they sort of laugh back and they're like, oh, ho, we were just kidding. So um, th- there's I think TikTok rewards that much more than it rewards just general negativity. Yeah, I think you can like t- you can typically filter out those negative um commenters or trolls or whatever up to a certain degree where i think like the the there's certain fundamental people that are out there that obviously are on every platform and they're usually either really sociopathic or just like extremely vitriolic people in general and their entire purpose online is to just cause anger and like those types of people you might not be able to change their mind or make them feel another way but then there's also like the politically motivated people or if you're super against whatever the thing is politically or ideologically in any way then you're also probably not going to get them to budge especially if it's you know like fundamentally against your like if you're the washington post i mean this would be like maybe an alt-right type person or (laughs) if like if for me like working with corporate brands this is like more the leftist anarchist types like they're just so anti corporate Corporate that no matter what I say, it's not going to really puncture their armor in any way. Like they are set in what they think. They know exactly what's going on with like the the interaction <laughs> yes. itself. Like there's no like breaking that uh, tension. But I think right. like past those people, you can really break down someone's psychology pretty easily with comments because a lot of people are just looking for attention. They're just either either looking for a reaction or they're looking just to be heard in some way. Like I feel like. So many of the commenters on social media on any platform, they're just shouting into the void, like hoping somebody responds. So when you do respond, it like immediately disarms them to be like, oh, yeah, there's a person there. I I forgot about that from shouting into the void all day. (laughs) Right. And that's and that is actually one of the huge advantages of TikTok that I didn't previously really have where um, like the videos I would publish for the post or, or even IJ before that they were kind of all over the place and I wasn't always in them, but now people like they sort of associate, Oh, like a human face that's responding. And yeah, I think most of them, yeah. most of them by now know that I'm the person actually responding. So it's really hard for them to like really come after me, especially when I am pretending to be this earnest 60 year old. <laughs> <laughs> Have you had like, this is something we, we kind of touched on this um, yesterday and we were talking about the show. Do you have like any, stalkers or any like weird <laughs> yeah. people like I, I feel like you you just I, I don't know what the numbers I mean I know it's in the millions of impressions that you reached as far as people that have viewed these things but like your face is all over them so I mean obviously it's still TikTok it's still kind of like a niche part of the internet but obviously you're you're plastered everywhere so I mean like so, have you had anybody follow you in like a weird way or whatever um, so yeah, uh, the best, the best way to sort of explain it is, uh, I, sometimes I Google myself, uh, I do it for vanity reasons, but also because there's another guy named Dave, named Dave Jorgensen, who's a honky tonk country singer in Oklahoma. Uh, and he has a website, it's called DaveJorgensen.com, And I like to pretend that him and I are in a battle, even though he doesn't know it about <laughs> who's going to get more like Google mentions. And he also sometimes like I'm from Kansas city and he plays sometimes in Kansas city. So he'll be up on a billboard and he'll say, like Dave Jorgensen's coming to town and my friends will like send me a Snapchat <laughs> like, Hey, you're coming. I'm like, no, shut up. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, anyway, I, I, I like to check in on Dave Jorgensen, hockey talk singer, but as now when I type my name into Google, uh, the autofill, it shows Instagram. It says Dave Jorgensen, Instagram, Dave Jorgensen, girlfriend, Dave Jorgensen, wife, and then Dave Jorgensen, the name of my wife. And I was like, okay, what? this is getting, yeah. Um, and so, and that's why my Instagram is private. Um, you can certainly follow me and I'll tell you my account later if you're, but I, I just, I had to have that corner of my life just be, just be in, you know, private literally. Yeah, yeah. And so, and I do get plenty of requests and sometimes people will message me on Instagram and, and most of them are just pretty nice. They're, you know, uh, they just, I think most of the time are just kind of earnest fans. Uh, Twitter, I get just all kinds of weird stuff. <laughs> um, uh, I have it's found always very, Twitter, man. <laughs> it's always Twitter. And I, I have my DMs open because honestly, it's awesome. Like open DMs have allowed me to connect with people to make tick like the whole Julian Castro TikTok started with a DM from someone on his campaign. That's so, so wild. Like, 
So I keep them open because like that's there's a lot of opportunities in that way. Um, so and I think it, even you reached out to me that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like there, you know, most of it's good, but every so often I just get uh, insane uh, DMs, and it's mostly gay dudes, which is flattering. Uh, you know, I think uh, I, I might, I'm just a, a straight white guy, but I, I'm very flattered because gay people are much more open about how they feel about me, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, they you- will. I mean, you you saw it on our group chat the other day. <laughs> just someone we know was just telling me. So yeah, I, I it's actually hot. like it's you're yeah. hot. It's fine. So it, it's real. It's <laughs> it, it's certainly good for my self esteem. But at a point, I, I just kind of I just stop responding. Yeah, I mean, yeah. When you when you get it, when your DMs are open like that, I mean, you got to filter things out at some point. But yeah. So like on the on the note of the the Julian Castro bit, I mean, I know like he he had, the campaign person approached you and you guys got to collaborate. I know you've done other collaborations with presidential candidates at this point, but I'm interested to know. Um, someone else in that in that group chat mentioned this too. Like, have other people or organizations come to you at all for like? advertising like product placement or like a like a personal feature like hey we saw your your tiktok it's oh. doing really well like can we jump in on one sometime yeah i've gotten and i, I wish i could give you like any of the ones that have happened I've, I've been approached and you know some of them have been approached by are like uh like nonprofits and oh, you cool. know cli- and yeah and stuff that i actually would be really interested in doing but i can't as the Washington Post, that we just can't do that. Yeah, it's like an ethical uh, breach. It's an ethical breach. But I, uh, most of the people that have approached have been people that, like, in that way, I've been. I, I wish I could have uh, collaborated with them, but I just kind of say, no, I can't do that. Right. Um, but it is, it is kind of interesting to see the type of people who do reach out um, from like all over the map. And and what's really cool is just in general the, of the type of people that reach out about TikToks or collaborate or just maybe me retweeting their TikTok are like stu- almost overwhelmingly student newspapers. Mm. Um, and we, I've probably been contacted by like I don't upwards of 50 to 60 different student newspapers about just like, we love your TikToks or what do you think of the one we, this is our first TikTok. So that's been really oh, cool. That's to so see cool. That. Yeah. That's all yeah. I think that's really honestly over like the most rewarding thing out of all of this. Like certainly it's been great to the watching the growth and it's really fun and it's in my, I'm enjoying my job every day, but like actually seeing that type of effect is, is really cool. Well, you really are. I mean, in a lot of ways, one of the, if not the biggest, forerunner as far as like putting a face on a branded uh, media institution not just like publication wise but just brands in general i mean like even the types of brands that have become notorious on social media sites like twitter like the wendy's and and right. like, chipotle and all those types of like weird funny brands or whatever like i've seen i've seen a few of them on tiktok but pretty much all the content that brands, even like Red Bull, which does like a lot of like stunt, like GoPro type stuff. But mm-hmm. everything I see on these other TikToks for brands is like sponsored, th- like sponsored content where they clearly hire talent and everything yeah. is like there's actors and it's very produced or they like maybe, uh, what do you call it? Like they'll bring on another TikTok star like a uh, Brittany Broski. And they'll be like, hey, do like something like you did with the kombucha girl face with our product. And then she'll do that TikTok and maybe they'll re-upload it or something. Like you see some of that, but there's not a lot of branded personas that have like a face and a person behind them like yours. So you really are kind of paving the way. Like, do, do you know of any other people behind different I, brands or media institutions like you that are doing this? At yeah, this level, I think, at least. Uh, honestly, I think the best brand or whatever you want to call it institution is the NFL and not just the NFL TikToks, account, but their individual team accounts. Um, they have their general NFL account, which is usually just like the best plays from that Sunday or whatever. And, mm-hmm. um, but they they do it in a way where they they sort of they'll meme it like they'll put text on players and they'll be like you know jumping into money. like I can't think of an example but they actually they're really funny about it and they're really self aware and then the individual teams are so good because they bring in you know the star quarterback that you know if you're a big fan of the Kansas City Chiefs for instance mm-hmm. and they they do a really good job of of making those TikToks much more relatable and they shoot them like, I, I think similar to how we shoot them, which is like, it's pretty clearly shot on an iPhone, but then edited on the computer. So, uh, so the timing's good, but it still feels authentic. Right. And so, 
I, I honestly, I think the NFL does such a good job. And, and like, certainly there are, if you want to get to institutional problems, the NFL has had all kinds of issues the last, like, you know, 10 to 15 years. Yeah. But as far as TikTok goes, they, they are doing such a good job. Uh, and that's the one I always point to when people ask, like, who do you, and, because they also have like a very clear voice. Um, and that's, that's really hard to do. And, and one thing I've been very flattered is like all, a lot of the newspapers sort of try to, um, imitate what we're doing, which is great. But like, what I would hope is that more and more other, you know, media sites start to try to do their own specific thing, because I think that's much more valuable on TikTok is for everyone to kind of have their own, you know, a voice that reflects their media institution. Well, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And especially, you know, I'm sure that I haven't followed the NFL stuff. I've seen like a couple football related ones. I thought I think were NFL like through the for you page, but they still don't have like a person that's like their image though you know what i mean like they have right, like right, team sure. members and all that like you're probably the only one that i've seen at least that at, at the scale that you're on where your face is heavily associated with it and even though you bring in other co-workers and people that are part of it i mean it's still very clearly a voice that you've established that is very consistent with you kind of at the helm of it which is like really interesting because that's sort of the central piece to something like TikTok or or even like being like a YouTuber. It's like it's like the difference between someone who's a YouTuber like a Shane Dawson versus like the Vox or BuzzFeed for having a YouTube channel where they produce high quality content that has tons of subscribers but like there's not any one figurehead behind it. So you wouldn't call them like a YouTuber necessarily. Like I'd almost call you like a TikToker. In a way, if that's even a term, I've never said that out loud. I don't think I, I have said it, and then I, you just did exactly what I've been doing for like seven or eight months now. I was just like, "Is that a word? I don't know." Do, do we I, say that? Like, <laughs> I'll just leave. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I guess you're right. Um, and I, so it sounds like I did not answer your question correctly before that. No, no, you're but, fine. You're fine. I, I, I was interested uh, to know anyway if you had other accounts that you thought were like great or influential. But yeah, it is interesting, like thinking about the difference between a brand, which is kind of like a broad image of like production and, and different, you know, facets to it, but then you being like the personified embodiment of that brand. You know what I mean? Yeah, I like to think of it, you know, something that uh, probably perhaps unsurprisingly happens at, at the Post a lot is if people come for tours of the building, whether or not they're, you know, uh, a presidential campaign or just someone's friend or family visiting. Every so often you see someone giving a tour of the newsroom. And so I like to I, I watch those sometimes and I like to think of what I'm doing as like, I'm giving you a tour of the newsroom every day mm. uh, in a very specific way. So just like a sort of uh, like, maybe I'm just trying to downplay my role a little bit, but I, I, I kind of want it just to be seen as just like a tour guide of the Washington post. And I, I just want it to be like, oh, you, I'm someone you can trust. Like I wouldn't let you down in what you're about to see in the next 15 seconds. Uh, but here's my face. You know, what's about to happen. We're about to see some part of the newsroom. So I like to think of it as I'm just kind of like showing you the newsroom and, and maybe you'll, if this TikTok is about what's going on in the news, you'll learn a little bit of something. No, I, I love that. And it, and it goes back to what you mentioned before about just kind of un- understanding the egos in the workplace and your your role in that which is really more of a steward of this like publication and this whole um, persona that you've developed rather than like the dictator at the helm of it like leading everything and like you're an ultimate command i mean it really does show like throughout that collaboration and just the the many people you include and it's it's very clear that it's not you're not trying to be the center of attention like i think as a fellow, you know, person with an ego, like, I would definitely say, like, per my job, like, working for a small, like, 20-person ad agency, which represents a small brand, where I'm the only person running, like, Stakem social media day-to-day. So, like, Mm -hmm. everything that I do in that, whether it's TikToks, YouTube videos that I, I, obviously, people help me produce, like, stuff for that on the video end. But as far as, like, being the, the person at the helm of that, like, it definitely comes with a pretty strong tendency to like feel the ego behind it like i'm in control like this is all my personality because it's me day in and day out which isn't good i mean it's like it's not good to be in a situation where like you feel like everything is on you to like put your whole personality and all your energy into it that way because ultimately it goes beyond you like when you're representing an institution or a brand like it's not 
it's not about you. You're just the person in that moment that's representing its voice in a way, which gets into that like weird blurred line territory where now you're like partially defining its voice in this new platform, right. but it's also right. like, you know, it's not totally you at the same time. Yeah. And I, I think we all, you know, learned a lot of that from the YouTube sort of initial, the first YouTube generation of people that sort of came out of it pretty scarred. Like, you know, a lot of those YouTubers either just kind of stopped making them all together. It, it became overwhelming because mm-hmm. it was just all about them. And, and they were very good at what they did. And, you know, like you mentioned Shane Dawson, like Shane Dawson, someone who I think he started to surround himself with more people because that sort of allowed him to to continue to exist in this world. And you see, like, already you have the TikTokers, the TikTokers, the TikTokies, <laughs> the TikTok guild TikTok making, yeah. the TikTok, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> the, the horde creating their own hype house, uh, which is yes. like, you know, and, and, you know, as, as kind of silly as it might seem, and the article about it is like, oh my God, there's just a bunch of 16 year olds in this house. Like, if you really read some of the, the quotes about like these hype house people, at least from what what was shown in the article is they're really there to support each other, you know, both um, within their actual accounts, like literally, but also just emotionally. And and that's something that I think is actually fairly new in the sort of internet age of um, you just, you shouldn't make it all about yourself, even if you want it, like, even if you're, ego does demand it. It's just over time, it's not going to be a good thing for anyone, viewers or the creators. Yeah. And I think part of it too, is I think these kids are so smart that like they don't get enough credit for like just how much they think about this stuff because they did grow up with it and Mm -hmm. they've gotten to see all the failures of like our generation. Like you mentioned, like the whole thing with Shane, like there's tons of YouTubers like that, that have from over the years, like started at one point, like in 2005, 2006 or whatever, and they hit like a slump. And then some of them come back, but some of them just, like, fade into either irrelevancy where they have, like, mental breakdowns or or they get canceled for whatever it is. Like, there's all these things that we can kind of, like, study at this point. And it's also pretty clear, I think, for a lot of the kids where they look at these past examples that, like, hype and clout and internet fame and all that is so fleeting. Like, it comes right. and goes so fast. Like, you could be... On top of the world, everybody's talking to you, talking about you right now, and then in a year, everybody's forgotten about you, and they don't care. Like they're on to the new things. So, I mean, with that, I think the, they know they're aware at least that you know, in some way, whether it's conscience or maybe a little bit subconscious, that they have to kind of like not not leech, but like collaborate in a way where they know someone else has clout and they have clout, and they're like, oh, how can we like amplify this together and then bring on other people who maybe have a little bit less clout than us and then bring them up and then maybe somebody bigger than us we can like get with them and there's all these like weird mental um facets to this whole game that they're having to think about because they're aware like the, they don't I, I even what's her name like the the main the uh the, the main like queen of it, tiktok charlie yes uh, yeah charlie yeah. or charlie however you say her name G- <laughs> d'amelio or d'amelio she we're um, getting there i don't uh, know surely yeah <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, I see her all over the For You page, like not even just her, but like people that duet her videos and like try to copy her stuff or, or meme it or whatever it is. And it's just so interesting because like, I think, so I started like three weeks ago on TikTok and in that time, she's gained millions of of uh, followers on it, literally just within that three week period that yeah. I've been on yeah. the app. So I mean, even for someone like her, like I'm sure she's just some... I have no idea what her background is. Like, I'm sure she's kind of like... She's into dancing. That's what I know. She's, yeah, yeah. She wants to be a professional dancer. Sure, so. yeah. But, like, I, I'm yeah. sure that, like, unless there's some, like, secret corporate manufactured agenda, like, underneath her that maybe I just haven't seen or hasn't been uncovered yet. Like, she was just some kid who ends up going viral and is now this major star. So, like, there has to be some level of self-awareness to these these kids that are getting famous so quick on this platform to be like, this came out of nowhere, and we have to kind of, like, think about, you know, how we interact with the culture itself, because they're, they're not, like, they're not, like, child stars, like a Justin Bieber or an Aaron Carter, right. who, from, like, the time they were six years old or eight years old, they were, like, being, like, fed a silver spoon, like, this is, you, you have the world at your fingertips, and you're gonna be this huge star, and then they crash at age 18, like, they're kind of growing into it with this huge backdrop of, of other people's experiences that they can take from. So, and I might be giving them too much credit. Like I said, I don't really know much about them, but at least from the well, outside looking in, that's kind of how 
I like to think about their their actions and their decisions and all this. Yeah. First of all, I love that one of your examples was Aaron Carter. I never would have thought of Aaron Carter. But that's <laughs> <laughs> I feel like people always say Macaulay Culkin, but Aaron Carter is so funny because I haven't thought about him since I was a kid. Uh, but you're I'm sure you're right. You, I don't I don't know what he's up to. You but. gotta get back on the Aaron Carter train, dude. <laughs> he he okay. released a single a couple years ago called Fool's Gold. I'm obsessed. <laughs> it's phenomenal. He's but he's but he's so I mean he he is like a total like troubled child star. I mean his family is sure. insane. He's also very mentally unstable and has a lot of ups and downs and, is, and clearly needs help in a lot of ways. But he's just he comes to mind because he he recently had this single Fool's Gold that it, it's yeah. Great I'm gonna song. make a note to Fool's Gold TikTok soon. Um, please, that'll be, please. But I won't say why. I won't say why. <laughs> it's just it'll just be for listeners of this and they'll know. <laughs> Oh if, my God! If it comes out, just just comment. I know, or something like, <laughs> that. and we'll all be in the know. I would. Uh, it, it would. Uh, it would be the greatest thing I'd ever seen. But yeah, that's yes. just that's just an example. But yeah. Yeah, but uh, but also well, I was going to actually my actual uh, contribution. That's not just <laughs> talking. <about the> part. <laughs> um, I think that that Vine, you know, preemptively just sort of shutting down because Twitter wanted to shut it down, or the reasons are still kind of scattered. I've heard like a million different reasons. Mm-hmm. Was actually such a hidden gift because the reasons to shut down aren't really important. The point is that Vine just shut down and then all these Viners, you know, had to figure out what to do. And, you know, obviously most of them went to YouTube and, and then a year later, Jake Paul was burning down his house or whatever happened. So, um, (laughs) (laughs) that's a a great sentence right there. Spike closed. And so a house burned. And so, uh, (laughs) <laughs> and, and then TikTok was born. But uh, I think that, you know, just by that happening, a lot of this generation, like, you know, Charlie D'Angelo, TikTok or whatever her name is, she um, she probably saw Vine just shut down when she was like 12 or 13. And so now she she goes into TikTok knowing this could all be gone the next yes, day. Yeah. And, and that's not to say that there, there's no reason at all that TikTok should be gone tomorrow. It's just continuing to grow. And like, it's doing things so much better. And that's so much smart that the, so much smart. It's so much smart. Um, <laughs> it's <laughs> we're getting, as we get into hour two, that's when I start. No, I love it. Keep it going. <laughs> um, and so, at, at, TikTok is really smart about what they do, and, and there's no reason that it won't shut down, and they're much better at it than TikTok. But uh, whenever someone asks me, like, you know, is TikTok going to be around in a year? Like, of course, I think – I personally think, yes, they'll definitely be around a year. They might even do something like – pull off something like Facebook where they find out a way to be around uh, almost seemingly permanently. Uh, but, like, there's no – you shouldn't go into the next year planning for that. Like, what I learned from – you know, I kind of look at my personal, my short career as of now, um, before 2017 and after 2017, uh, kind of in 2014, 2015, 2016 at IJ.com, like all of our traffic relied on Facebook. And that was a big reason everything went to shit is because Facebook started messing with the algorithm and trying to do all these different things. And they started prioritizing video and then Facebook live, and then they changed their minds. And so all these different factors you had to account for every single day, they were changing every two weeks. Mm -hmm. So it was just, it was all over the map. And, and and through that, I learned like, you can't make long-term plans in video, at least right now you can, I mean, you can set those goals. You should absolutely set goals. And I'd have plenty of goals for our TikTok account, but you have to wake up each day knowing that like something could shift in the algorithm and, and, um, it doesn't mean it's not worth it. It's 100% worth it, but it's just, I, I will, I will never be surprised by, by anything happening in video social media anymore. Yeah. I mean, that was literally just today. That was the breaking news of the college humor and how they've laid off virtually their entire staff for that exact reason. Just, I mean, the fact that Facebook essentially monopolized, you know, the digital media space years ago where, you know, brands have been sharing their, their, their websites and, and sort of like, um, like landing pages through Facebook to, to bring consumers off site to wherever they were based out of. But then Facebook decided, nope, we're going to take all that away and we're only going to reward native uploaded stuff. So you have to now bring all your content to us. And then even with that, the algorithm is so like selective and confusing that you can't guarantee 
what's going to get eyeballs in the first place. So now all these platforms that used to rely on it for traffic, like it's just, it's so, so bizarre. Like how the, you know, you and I growing up, you know, we remember, I'm sure you remember like websites like, um, like something awful, which I reference a lot on this show yes. or like uh, E-bombs world, <laughs> E-bombs world, um, albino black sheep, uh, uh, home star runner. There was like all these different comedy <laughs> forum Homestar. blog, like, yeah, like there's, there's so many and like, and you would, when you heard about them, you would search them online and then you'd go directly to them. Right. Whereas like now you don't really do that. Like you go to Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, YouTube, all these like main megalith platforms and then they take you to wherever you're going to go. So like everything is really in their hands and it's it sucks to be a publisher for any kind of content now because we're all so tethered to these tech corporations. Yeah, and, and that shift of, of you of seeking out the news versus the news finding you was happening while I was uh, in college. I was, a, I was an English major, but I was uh, in this thing called Media Fellows, which was just basically an honors journalism program. Mm -hmm. And all of our classes for like every single year was, was just talking about uh, like, how is the newspaper going to survive and, or like how will Facebook kill the news? Like in 2012, we already knew like, this is not good for people just generally speaking. And so we were already trying to find the solutions and I, I couldn't even tell you what we came up with. We probably had a bunch of crazy theories and theses on what could happen, but like you could see this coming along a far, way away but now it's gotten to a point where like well this is the reality now we have to find a way to get people back into if if not being informed just like getting content that's actually quality because um there's just so many different platforms that can just pull any lever at any point and your entire business has failed unless you've sort of diversified and you know, have a page on TikTok and Twitter and Snapchat and all that. And it's so hard to do that. Like, you know, of all people like working in this specific industry, like how difficult it is to diversify your energy and your resources to different platforms. Because if you want to do one really well, you have to spend so much time like in it and understanding it. Like you can't just like, like I I always get on marketing people about this because so many, and it's not like in a lot of cases, it's not literally the marketing person's fault, but rather the the place they work for in some way that's kind of enforced this notion. But so many of these people that work in marketing or advertising, they have this idea in their heads like, oh, well, I work at an agency or I work for this brand and I have to operate so many channels and I'm going to use some tool like Sprout Social or whatever it is that schedules all my posts. And then that becomes the entire job where you're just like, typing copy into a website that aggregates the content to all these other platforms. And a lot of people have to do that because they're under-resourced at wherever they work, so they can't (laughs) spend that time. But when you do that, you're missing out on so much of your potential for learning and understanding the actual culture and references and, like, what's actually relevant within those platforms, which is, like, you, you need multiple people to do that. Like, with you doing TikTok, you wouldn't be able to do... YouTube and Facebook and Instagram at the same oh, yeah. level no while way. you're doing TikTok. Like, it's just not possible. Right. And I, I, I worry that I don't want any listener to be like, oh, no, everything's going to hell. But it's just it's it's sort of you just have to approach it with a healthy skepticism. Like and as far as it goes, like TikTok has in every platform I've worked on, which has included uh, Facebook, vid- Facebook video, Twitter video, YouTube video, Snapchat video, like TikTok has been the one that I've felt the best about, um, and, and just in terms of feedback and how the, how the algorithm works and how, like you really are rewarded for good content as, as of now. So th- at least there's that s- silver lining. Yeah, no, totally, totally. I mean, yeah, we can, I, I, hopefully the people listening, they know it's not all doom and gloom. I mean, I, I, this yeah. stuff's just all, it's always changing and it's, and it is always good to be skeptical of it because it's not, it's not necessarily like the world's going to end tomorrow, but it is like, it's so we're all on shaky ground and it's good to be aware of that. So we can kind of like, you know, move with the punches or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, if they, if anything, we know for sure that they know the song fool gold by Aaron Carter. Yes. Oh, dude, ed- anyone listening to this needs to look it up right now. It is <laughs> it's the most underrated meme song that I've heard in years. Like it never became a thing. Like it, it t- he released the song, it got like a couple million views on YouTube or whatever and it got a few million streams, but like I loved it so much and never <laughs> understood why it didn't catch on. <laughs> Maybe this is the moment. This is what's going to get people talking about fool's gold. Like, all I, the... <laughs> I, I, like I, w- I, obviously we're going to keep talking, but like, there's this stuff. Like, I can't wait, but I, I, I just, 
I, I have to like, I'm that much, uh, of like a crazy coffee person where I'm like, I gotta, but yeah, I'll wait. You're half, <laughs> you're, you're like, your mind's only half in the rest of this podcast now. It's fine. Okay. It's fine. Okay. I was so just to kind of like jump back into what we were talking about. So obviously we could go on forever, just like ranting about the state of tech and media and all that. But just to kind of get back to like what you do specifically, you, you mentioned like, I don't know what it was like 15 minutes ago or something like that, where we were talking about just how your creative processes, like when you're developing these videos, you, you mentioned that you'll often like shoot something and then you'll, rec- you'll do the, the post-production and like other programs or whatever. Like, is that yeah. typically your, your, your standard way of doing things? Do you ever do like, do you ever shoot TikToks natively or do you do everything in like another program or, or what's your approach there? The only time I, I will ever do it natively, you know, in app is when I use the, uh, like an effect on TikTok because, mm-hmm. um, you could theoretically, and I, I have done this a couple times, you could use an effect on TikTok and they have a lot of great ones and then publish the video privately and then save that video and then take that clip and then edit it on your computer. But as soon as you, you know, do that, you, one, you, uh, the quality goes down to 720 from 1080. So the quality is much worse. There's a, there's now a, um, Oh, what's the word? This is terrible. I can't. A, uh, the, you know, your at is on it. Your, yeah, uh, right. Like the, the there's stamp. a bug. Yeah. There's some, yeah. And so you have to basically frame that out. And so at that point, your video is half the quality it was before. Um, and then the other reason, if you if you want to use an effect on TikTok, if you publish it natively right there, uh, you get a little stamp in the corner that says like you know earthquake effect or whatever you use, and that and people will find your TikTok by searching through that effect. So uh, it's actually an advantage to use uh, the effect within that. But otherwise, yeah, I edit everything else. Um, in Premiere Pro on my computer, which is how I premiere or how I um, edit any videos I do. And uh, I honestly think that's like super important. It's a little bit painstaking at times because for whatever reason, it can be very difficult sometimes to get video off your iPhone, especially 4K video into your computer. It's a weird task, but uh, I figured out a few ways to do it when it's not working so well. So it's fine. But uh, yeah, I mentioned the 4K. So um if the if the shot isn't quite how I like it, I can reframe it a little bit because now that's twice the quality I need. Um, so it just allows for a lot of moving around and and making sure that every um, beat, every moment, every like action someone does fits right in with the music or the sound. Um, and I'll edit it with that sound. Like I'll download like the, for instance, the one today we did is with uh, our, our Jonathan K part, uh, and it was just a sound where someone's going what huh. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. So that one, I downloaded the separate TikTok with that sound, and I put it underneath, so that way I could make sure it was timed perfectly. And that way, when I brought it back into the app, I could, I could make sure that the sound was aligned. That's so um, smart. That's what I was wondering because I know you do a lot of syncing with like the audio memes, and I also could see that you do a lot of off-platform editing. So that syncing process is what I was wondering, like how you nail that. So that's that's cool. You do that with. Yeah, and it's and like I, the thing is, you can actually you. You don't even technically have to upload the sound once you bring it back in the app. So, for instance, the one today, I ended up putting a little bit more space between, uh, I think it was me saying something versus Jonathan saying, huh? Uh, Because I just wanted a little bit more of a beat there. So I actually adjusted the audio to add a couple seconds. And so when I brought it back in the app, I still said, use this sound, the the original goofy sound, but then I just turned the volume all the way down on that sound. And I brought up the soundtrack volume or sorry, the, the uh, original sound from our footage. And so it still shows in the bottom right corner that that's the sound we borrowed from, but now it's just all my original audio. So it all syncs up nicely. That's so interesting. Yeah. I literally, today was the first TikTok that I've done in uh, premiere, like every other (laughs) one I've done natively at this point. And, That's impressive. Well, it's it's I'm realizing now just like how limiting it is. Like I've always kind right. of been under the impression like, oh, most of these creators must be doing it natively. But as I go on, I'm realizing all these little tricks and, and things that I'm noticing in the videos that I'm like, this is not possible to do <laughs> within yeah. TikTok. Like there's so much you can't do that, that people do to kind of get that edge to, to give you like more uh, probability, I guess, of going viral or whatever. Yeah, and that's kind of my goal is to make you know sometimes look looking or making something look effortless is like the hardest thing to do, but it's always worth it for me on TikTok anyway. Like it it always whenever it just feels like it was just shot on the iPhone natively in the app and it just like really flows well, people love it. And that you know to bring up the Julian Castro one again, that one was like our most popular because everything lined up perfectly. 
but it felt like it was happening in the moment. Like we actually went back and forth and shot every one second segment, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, so people like it when it's smooth like that, but this is something I've been trying to explain to some of my coworkers as I've gotten them more involved in the, the videos is that like, it feels at least with not just the algorithm, but even just with my own perception of like what I see as a, as a funny or a successful video in general is that it really does come down to milliseconds. Like there's certain yeah. takes you'll do and the take itself might seem perfect, but maybe you like held the camera for a little too long or like you caught something at the end that just wasn't perfect or there's a little bit of dead air that shouldn't be there. And it, and it could literally be like, milliseconds like not even a full second but all of that comes down to how successful the video is going to be and i it's it's just so interesting i wonder how much of that not only tracks and how people are um like like perceiving and consuming the videos but then also how the algorithm uh considers it as well because it really does feel like there's certain videos i've done and overall i'm like oh this is i feel i feel pretty good about this but maybe i whipped it up and like 10 minutes and looking back there's parts of it where there's a bunch of like dry air in between words i said or like right the end cut off like was a little too late and you caught like a smirk or like just something at the end that just like right. didn't make the payoff perfect so it's just interesting how all those like little moments all do matter when you're like producing these videos well and it's funny because you know you don't sometimes you you do want that randomness to leak in just to kind of again like create that sort of authenticity mm. but you never know like if it's going to work so the one we the, the same one i was talking about today i ended up keeping someone kind of laughing in the background at the end because sometimes i've i've noticed if someone's laughing behind the camera people sort of even if they're not aware of it they kind of enjoy that they yeah. like that someone broke um so i kept it in but then like 20 minutes later, I was like, should I have kept it in? I, like, I really don't know. Um, and I, I'll overthink it a bunch of times. I'll even, when I edit it on Premiere, what I'll do is when I'm, when I'm completely done with it, I'll take the everything I've edited and then I'll just copy and paste it like four times and I watch it basically on a loop on my computer mm -hmm. to see how it feels playing over and over again. And I think it was you that commented today about how the sort of beginning and end kind yeah, of flow loop. together. Yeah. Yeah. The loop. And so that was, that's all very intentional. Like if I can do it, I try to make it where it's very almost comforting to just keep rewatching. How, how do you not burn out when you're, when you're doing <laughs> that? Because I mean, honestly, like I feel this, I was trying to put together text on a TikTok last night in the, like natively in the platform. And I was just like watching the same video over and over and over again. As I'm like editing the text. Like, but not that even... text editor is awful, by the way. Oh, it's, it's terrible. And I use it. I hate it. It's yeah. so bad. Like, like the fact that it limits the amount of time to one second and like you can't yeah. play at sometimes when you're trying to move things around. So you can't like synchronize perfectly and, it, and it, you can't like pause it because it always has to like play all the way through. Well, you can pause it, I guess, but it just plays well, all the way really through. And it's really hard. If you've made like two or three separate ones, you can't go back to the first one that easily and yes. edit it. Yes. Uh, it's, it's truly awful. It's, it's, that's, you know, that's what almost breaks me. It's funny. You asked that question with the text editor, but, <laughs> but I know otherwise though, I, I don't really get exhausted by it because, um, I think honestly, all of my like work up until now before TikTok was so much more stressful because I was expected <laughs> to make like, you know, often I would make it, it, probably two, three minute videos a week, which is pretty exhausting, especially because I hold, I, I try to hold my videos to a pretty high standard. Yeah. I'll kind of, I will comb through every second of a three minute video and really make sure it looks good. And so kind of going from, you know, a, like a three minute video, what that's, that's uh math is hard. 12. That's like, that could be up to 12 TikToks or around that. Right. Uh, it's, that's how much I'm producing in two and a half weeks. Whereas it used to be something I was trying to produce in two days. So um, obviously TikToks have different plots and things going on, but it's, it's still crazy to think about that. And I think that kind of perspective uh, keeps me from burning out with the TikToks. Yeah. The standard definitely shows. I mean, I, I literally, I was, I was joking with, I think it was my, my coworker, Jeff, about this, um, just with your, your, uh, your portfolio, I'll say, of TikToks that you've had. Like, we were joking because when I started doing Stakem's Twitter like three years ago or so, um, the guy who ran who ran the uh, the Moon Pie account, he was like the guy to me as far as like his his name is Patrick Walls. Like, I've, I've done a podcast with him. He's a he's a great great friend. And he um, at the time I had no idea who this guy was. I just saw the account and I thought it was brilliant and clever. But at the same time, I kept looking at it like, oh, like I want to like it was what I was striving for. So I used it as like a competitive motivator, essentially. But I realized really quick that like I couldn't 
get my like I didn't have the same and I still don't have the same level of just like wit I guess as he does like he's a very clever creative person so the things he's able to come up with copy wise are just things that I would just never I would just never think about you know like it's just out of my sort of bandwidth as far as like how my brain works you know so like I I learned pretty quick like okay I'm not going to be able to compete with this guy with the platform he has um, putting out this level of creativity so I'll just try to like out hustle him essentially like I, and i again didn't even know him like this is all in my head like i'm using this as like a competitive motivator so i would just like do a shit ton of tweets and like just really tried to build the account that way eventually it worked obviously it's not as big as moon pie it probably won't ever be but like it got its own success through like just a mass amount of quantity so i kind of mm-hmm. went into tiktok with that same exact mindset where i looked at you you were my moon pie this time around, I was like, I was like, Dave with the Washington Post is putting out the most perfect, clever, like well produced. You, you set that up in such a way that by the time you said you were my moon pie, I was so flattered. <laughs> but now, like, I'm like outside of my body right now, laughing at the fact that I was. I'm the moon pie. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, I'm sorry. It's so true. It's literally true, though. And that's that's right. how I looked at it. Like I just what? can't believe how happy I was when you said <laughs> that. Like, <laughs> it's I saw like I said. I joined three weeks ago. Prior to that, I didn't know really anything about. I mean, like I knew it came from musically, and I had seen TikToks all over Twitter before, so I knew what it, the the theme and like what it was about essentially. But I didn't know anything about the culture or like how to produce these. Like I was never on Vine doing it myself. So this was all like new territory for me so when i got on and like i looked at all these other brands and i saw what you were doing i was like okay this is this person this team or whatever has it all together this is the the archetype that i'm going to kind of gun for but i realized pretty much the same thing that i realized with moon pie where i was like you've obviously done video editing for years like you have a really creative eye like there's all these assets that you bring to the table that right now at least i just don't have so i just started like spitballing and throwing shit at the wall to try to make stuff work and that's what's so good about what you do though because you you play to your strengths just as i would play to mine and i think that like the stake of this brand is already so strong that like the transition felt natural because you were just bringing what you already do to tiktok like the the christmas tree tackle thing is so good (laughs) and it and it's so like you you watch it and you're like oh that makes sense like you don't even question because it, it's so you know for lack of literally on brand and it right. just feels right and you play to their strengths immediately and I think that's really all you have to do thanks man yeah, that, and that's that's yeah. what I was gonna get at is like I mean obviously there's always you know new tools to add to the toolkit like I said today was the first time I've used Premiere and I'm definitely gonna like start trying to script things and be more careful with trying to like get into the algorithm but it is interesting how there's like so many approaches and standards and all that but I, I really do think it's it's a uh, it's admirable the level that you've brought the publication to in this way because obviously it is it's the Washington Post isn't a frozen meat, beef sheep brand you know like it's <laughs> it's something to be held to a certain not standard, yet so. <laughs> <laughs> this might be like an idiocracy thing uh, we're like not you? yet absolutely Washington Post yeah <laughs> But yeah, so anyway, j- just yeah, just uh, on that note. But I, all, so w- what I was trying to get at before I went on that whole pre ramble, I guess, is that something that everybody, including myself, is trying to figure out with this platform, like as I kind of experiment with these videos, is like how to appease the almighty algorithm because. <laughs> I don't understand it. I feel like most people in general don't understand it because it's, obviously it's a mystery to a certain degree. But um, for you, I mean, like when you first started on it, like was there one video that I guess picked up right away that got caught in it? Or like how did you kind of figure out along the way via not just the production itself but hashtags and trends and all that? Like what was the, the, the journey like for you toward understanding the algorithm? Well, it's tough because, you know, initially I was just, I, as I mentioned earlier, I was, I was kind of doing like some TikToks were for Twitter, like that Marty Baron one, and some were for clearly for TikTok niche. So I was trying to figure out too, like, how do I balance this? How do I balance the Washington Post identity in the newsroom, their identity on Twitter, their identity as a newspaper and TikTok? So I was, I was factoring all of it in so much. And then I finally just got to a point where like, I'm just going to do like really recent popular memes on TikTok right now. And I did that for like, I still do that a lot, but for the first month, it was very much just like whatever's trending. Uh, I asked, you know, Teddy on our social team to like send me the weirdest ones he finds. Cause he's on TikTok like five hours a day. And I would just find like the, 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 um, 
the trending sounds or whatever that had taken off in like the last 20 hours. Cause that was always the sweet spot. Like, and I'll still do that today. If I see a TikTok that took off like tomorrow morning, I go into work and I see a TikTok that, that took off literally overnight. If that sound is anything I can do and that I can apply to the newsroom, I will do it. I'll drop everything else I had planned that day. And I'll do that one because right. there's a really high chance of that just going viral just off of the back, literally of the success of uh, that previous TikTok. So, um, I started doing that a lot. I really just, I just kind of immersed myself in the, the culture of TikTok. Um, I don't, I don't really know what the first one was that did really well. The first one that was very on brand that did well. And I think it was like either a third or fourth one was, uh, basically just like us dancing. And it was like, uh, someone was representing the parents and they're really badly dancing. And I was representing the Washington post and I was really badly dancing, which for me is just me dancing. And, <laughs> And then we did like in the middle, we did like a, at the end, we did a, like a sort of awkward handshake and it was says, and it said trying to be cool on TikTok, and that right there, like off the bat established what we were trying to do, which we've already sort of talked about, which is like, we don't know what's going on. We just want to be here and we hope you accept us. And I think people latched onto that really quickly. And so like our core base of followers who are still very vocal kind of always protected us and insulated us from the trolls, but also like helped build us up and make it clear that we were, you know, a brand, so to speak, that you could trust on TikTok. Right. Yeah. It is just such a wild, um, just experience, just trying to understand like how the whole thing worked. Cause it isn't like any other platform really in a sense where you could just start on TikTok at, you know, the ground level and then do one and then it just blows up or you could do like a hundred of them and none of them go anywhere. So it is like, there's so many little factors involved, not just with the trends and everything, but like understanding relevant hashtags and like, I I want to say like one of the things I think I've personally run into with it is the the facial recognition element at least sure. it just might not be a thing but like I feel like it's a thing because I've noticed in ones where like I'll I'll try to include coworkers or whatever that have more faces like they'll do better I think on average than the ones that are only me in the box head thing cuz like right. it's it's very strange cuz like there's not really anything I can avoid with that like there's still a person like there's hands and a body moving but i think even just little stuff like that where like the algorithm just isn't recognizing that this is a human being in it in some way like there's always like little tricks and things that kind of go along with your potential i guess to get caught up in it you know what i mean yeah it's tough and i at one point uh, some uh, a tiktok rep had told me like you should try to appear at least in the beginning of all your tiktoks because and and they said that's because that's what the fans are expecting. But I do wonder how much of that is like, is the algorithm just picking up on a face a familiar? I don't, I don't really know. Um, I personally, like I've been all over the internet for like a decade now, <laughs> you know, <laughs> me, me and hockey tonk country singer, Dave Jorgensen. And <laughs> so I, I don't, you know, personally care about my face, whatever being there. So that's fine with me. But, um, I, I don't, it, it is tough to sort of figure out like, what is it that latches them on the first three seconds? And I still don't really know. I, I do know that if it's just like, extremely different from the last TikTok, you you probably will catch someone. Like mm-hmm. if it's just really weird and wild or at the very least like a familiar space with something weird happening, which is often what we do with our newsroom ones, then you can kind of catch their attention. But it does seem to just sort of vary day by day. I, I, um, I imagine part of it too is like you need that immediate effect of like drawing somebody in. Like the first three seconds, the person has decided whether or not they're going to stay on the video or not. So you have to like get them right away and not in all cases, but in some cases I imagine that's at least part of it. Just that, that hook. Yeah. And, and kind of back to your a question, a, a couple of questions ago about the, the ones that obviously that one did well, where we, we shook hands in the middle and we're trying to be cool on TikTok. But then right after that, we did one, uh, where it was just me in the mirror and it was like a really common meme already where you just slowly zoom in on yourself in the mirror. And then at the very last second, you get a text from someone and it was like, you know, people would get texts. It was all, this part was faked. It was always like your mom saying like, you're grounded or like, or they'd get really dark and it'd be like, you know, girlfriend, I'm pregnant or something like yeah, that. Yeah. And so we had, I, I did it where it was set up and it said for the Washington post, it said, you're fired. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I, I published that and I kind of, I, I, I published it and like, it was just actually looking around, like, am I going to get actually fired for this? And then when that did well on TikTok and it did well on Twitter and no one in the newsroom fired me, I was like, okay, I think, <laughs> 
I think we have something. I think this could work because that was my first indication. Like, I think I might, you know, have some traction here. Right. Do you, have you noticed too, like, as you've kind of grown the account, do older posts ever get resurgences in virality? Like if something you posted like months ago that kind of petered or peaked at a certain point, do do Um, those ever get like another that you know like wave of uh, views or anything i they will get resurgences if they're like less than a month old i haven't really seen uh, at least to the extent of like actually like a real resurgence where it's almost going viral again Mm -hmm. i haven't really seen that uh at least when it's over or over a month old okay but i have seen where i mean i remember the first one of the first original tiktoks we posted which uh again at the beginning i was just copying other sounds just to try to get you know, in people's attention. But one of the first TikToks we we did, which was an original sound, was just a cadence I used to play on drumline in high school. And it was just people beating their heads against their desks to different beats and stuff. <laughs> um, and that one, like, I'm really proud of that one. It's it's genuinely a, a, a good TikTok. But like, I also knew when we published it that it might not do well because we didn't have many followers and like it was an original sound. Mm. Uh, but then about a month later, it suddenly kind of got picked up again. Oh, that's so, awesome. So, yeah, I think the ones when it does happen, it's usually an original sound that takes off. It's very rarely um, when you're using uh, jumping on a trend that's already right. happening. They, they kind of just if, die after. Yeah, well, they, or they or they will go viral right then and there, but they, they won't come back later. Yeah. Do you like so I'm interested to know this because you have a lot of. I guess what we could call bits as part of what you do. Like, and this is yeah. something that I, I love experimenting with with Stakeum where like we have like a rivalry with hot pockets or whatever. Like <laughs> we used to have like our, our intern Steve. So there's like all these like little things that can kind of be fun bits for Twitter, at least where people would kind of relate to and jump on and, and banter back and forth about. And I know like your big one, at least I haven't seen it recently, but that was the spam. And yeah. we, we talked about this and we, we hung out at social fresh. Like, do you uh-huh. think there's any, uh, not importance for the algorithm necessarily, but like as far as like building that community, like sort of the importance of having those reoccurring bits. Like, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think the spam thing. So part of the reason I've I done less spam lately, it's going to come back. Uh, there's two reasons. <laughs> Don't worry, everyone. Uh, one, it's I think there is like something funny about uh, like hitting a joke over the head until it's dead, which I did for a long time. But now I want people to kind of miss spam. So I'm sort of waiting for that to happen. And, and then we'll bring it back full force. And then two, there's people like way too many people were starting to think that we were sponsored by spam. So I wanted to squash that. Like, true, we're not sponsored. True. Yeah, yeah. I really did not want, but I, uh, that was, what's just so funny. Cause the whole joke, the whole reason I thought spam was so funny to keep putting in TikToks is like, who would ever be sponsored by spam? Like, that's why I felt, <laughs> that's why I felt safe doing it. And I was just, just laugh. I would like just where you right now. I would just laugh to myself, just by myself, about how funny it was that spam was in a TikTok. And right. like, well, can you imagine like spam approaching someone like we really want you to be in our TikTok? Like we really want you to feature jalapeno spam. <laughs> uh, we just have this new spam. It's it's called ground pepper spam, which okay. is a. <laughs> you, you, you've given them more free PR than they've probably had in years. <laughs> and it took them like five months for them to send me a spam blanket. I was like, finally, uh, <laughs> which I had to give away because journalistic ethics mean you can't keep anything. But right, uh, right. Yeah. Either, oh, and they sent me spandles, which are uh, flip flop spam oh sandals. Oh, my God. Uh, they sent me. Yeah, that was when it finally happened. I was like, thank you. But no, thanks. Yeah, um, like, this is amazing. But I can't be a shill for spam. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, as much as I would want to, please. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, I think the spam is the, the, the real reason, though, that I think it works outside of my just really dumb humor is I think people like to look for it in the background of TikToks. And for a really long time, I was putting it in the background of almost every single TikTok. Uh, there are probably some if you went back, you would be surprised to see spam like way in the back. And yeah. I am. I'm really big into Easter eggs. Like I like that in my TV shows. I like that just in general on media that I consume. I love inside jokes uh, that you can like that, that make you feel like you're within the inner circle of whatever this grand video or, or brand or whatever is. Right. That, that's my favorite part about even just getting to follow someone like you on Twitter where, you know, people that follow the account of Washington Post or whatever or whatever the brand might right. be, it's always great getting that insider look at, like, the person's commentary and their, the kind of inner workings of what they were thinking when they released the content, which is always a fun little thing. You know, it's, it's kind of dumb. Like, there's some people, I guess, that would be cynical about it. Like, who cares? But, like, it is... 
in a lot of ways, like looking inside like an artistic uh, process almost as, as yeah. goofy as it is, you know, and that's fine. Like, and the thing is, if they don't want to see that, then they, they don't have to, like they exactly. don't have to follow me. And, and yeah, like I'm one of those people that I, it's, it's crazy that the office is so prevalent now because of Netflix. But like when I was in high school, I would get the office DVDs and I would, I'd rewatch them constantly. And then I would listen to them with the director's commentary. <laughs> so like the fact that the office is now back is, and you probably have seen it in the TikToks. Like a lot of them are sort of mockumentary style mm-hmm. shot and they, they're meant to look like the office. So like, it's such a great advantage to me that Gen Z loves the office, but, uh, going back, like I would, I love com- DVD commentary. I've listened to it like for lost for like any show that I was really into or any movie that I really liked the second I get home. Uh, and my wife will, t- I'll, I'll just like read trivia for three hours about the movie. I'll read everything to the point where I've, <laughs> where I've ruined the movie for myself. Like I'll read, I'll, I'll, I'll find out how, what act, like what movies these actors were in together before, you know, I'll look into, like how the movie was made, how they like how much money, I, I, things that no one needs to know. It, it really matters to me for some reason. So, in that sort of same vein, is why I just like to build what I jokingly but also seriously say is the the sort of TikTok cinematic universe. Yeah, I, I, literally, I mean, somebody just made that meme to me actually on Twitter today about Steakum. Right. They were like, "This TikTok is like if TikTok's brought us anything for Steakum, it's that it's a window into the Steakum cinematic universe." And I was <laughs> exactly. dying. Yeah. Like, it's so true. And yeah. and even at the end of that rant. I mean, I'm again, just this is so uncanny that you were meant to marry my wife because (laughs) she is just so obsessed with the office and I can't stand it. Like I, I, (laughs) I never used to hate it, but when we started dating and then moved in together and, and since then, like I have, she, she watches the show 24 seven. Like she's at least watched the entire thing through three, four, probably five times in the past three years. And It's like the theme song has become, it's like PTSD for me. Like when it comes totally. on, I'm like, no, like that. Oh, and the theme song on Netflix, for some reason, Netflix, the theme song is like, Bang! it's so loud. <laughs> TikTok has a meme about that too, which is great, where it's uh, like, yep. yeah, falling asleep and then, Bang! yeah. So. Literally. And then she falls asleep to it too. So anyway, this is all just like, it's, it's, well, I'm sitting here rolling my eyes, like, oh my God, this is my, she's going to listen to this and just be like, right. oh, great. <laughs> tell, tell her I say, hey. I'm just kidding. No, but, uh, but, uh, no, but, but like, I think part I, I, this is I, I, I'm genuinely interested in the commentary stuff of whatever anything I'm in, into, but I think sometimes I do it because, like, the the first time I got really passionate about something was this small little book you might have heard of called Harry Potter. Oh my uh, god! And, again, she's obsessed with Harry. I'm sorry. Yeah. This is like this is so well, difficult for and, me to hear. And maybe she will. Maybe she'll. You should ask her about this afterwards, and uh, depending on her how she gets into Harry Potter. So sure. Uh, I how she gets it. You know. <laughs> Didn't sound what? weird at all, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Just depending on what Harry does for her. Anyway, um, so in this fantasy book, I I, I know I I, <laughs> I can't say anything seriously now. But my my grandpa actually he had come back from Scotland, and this is like 1998, and I I'm like seven, I think. And so he comes back from Scotland and the books are technically here in the U S but no one really knows about them yet. Mm -hmm. And so he brings me the first two Harry Potter books and I got so obsessed with them. And then like about two years later is when Harry Potter took off in the U S like actually became much more of a known thing. And then the movie came out in 2001, the first movie. And so at that point I would, as like, and now I'm 10 or 11 and I just hate it so much that everyone else uh, suddenly cares about this thing that I've cared about for <laughs> a, already a fourth of my life. You yeah, know? Harry Potter hipster, of course. Yeah, it, it, tr- it really, it really is the Harry Potter hipster thing. And like, and so the way I reacted to that was like, oh, I'm gonna read everything else by Harry Potter than I can read. So I would get all these like these fan theory books that people would write, like unofficial biographies oh of J.K. God. Rowling. Uh, there's this podcast that's still out. It's in its like 15th year called Muggle. She lit. My wife literally, she sends me links to this show all the time. Like she's, <laughs> she's gotten shouted out by them on her Twitter. Cause she's always like doing their trivia oh. things. <laughs> that's incredible. They Muggle cast followed me back on Twitter like two years ago. And I was like, so delighted. It was ridiculous. Anyway. That's great. <laughs> uh, so like I, I, that is how I would, the, the point being that I, I coped with everyone else being a fan by being a bigger fan. Like I wanted to know more than they did. So, yeah. So by doing that, felt like I was more, I don't know, it was still my thing. Uh, so, yeah. I, so I could, fandom I in a lot of ways is like your daddy issues. Like this is like, I, yeah. this is your childhood trauma. It's what just that. Daddy you... issues? Well, like that's, you know, it's not bad. 
That's great, man. No, that, that, that's awesome. And it's true. Like having that, I don't know, like maybe it's part of just like people like ours personalities. Like we're kind of obsessive and, and want to get things just right. Like it is part of that, you know, that drive to, to make something to create something and understand the whole process of how it's made, which is, it's, it's cool to be able to look behind the scenes and see all that. Right. Yeah, totally. I forgot how we even got there. You're right. Yeah. No, 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 no worries. <laughs> I, I was wondering too, like in all of this, because on that note of just being someone who gets obsessive and, and kind of gets into this behind the scenes and, and does all this digging, you, I know you've said you've like worked on like other, like doing like video production for other brands and whatnot, but I mean, have you ever gone into something like this on your own, like for your own sake? Like, have you ever created a YouTube channel for you or like done something for you in a way that's like projecting your ego and your thoughts out there. And you, I know you kind of, this is, I'm already answering my own question. I know you mentioned earlier, <laughs> you did like a podcast about survivor, yeah. I guess. I mean, that's the example, but have you done like anything else other than that, like that's kind of put your yourself out there or is this all really as you see it, like for work in a way? Um, it's really, it really is just that podcast and, and, and to that extent, like that podcast has become such an extension of like, like, yeah, we talk about, you know, survivor week to week, but like, it's, it's also, so my brother-in-law does that with me and a, and a good friend from college. And like, I, otherwise that friend from college, I don't think we would still even, you know, talk to each other. We just, we don't live in the same city. And, and my brother-in-law, like I now talk to him more than I talk to any of my three sisters. Like mm. we have now talked to each other for like thousands of hours. It's all recorded. It's all recorded too, in case anyone needs it. Uh, but yeah. And so like I, uh, that is my outlet for that. And the only reason I don't do it more for myself is I just, I can't spread myself too thin because as you mentioned, like right before, like I am very obsessive with things and in a way that I know how to be like, I know when to bring it to bring it back. Um, and if I like made my own TikTok account, which I do have a dummy account, but I don't use it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I would just stretch myself too thin because I would also like sort of demand perfection within myself. And, and I just, I don't think I could do it long term. Even this, the silly survivor podcast, like even that stretches me thin during the survivor season. Yeah. So it really is like, it, it's not for lack of wanting to, but, um, the, the, and I do, you know, I mentioned, when I started at, at IJ in 2014 at that joke site, like I liked the challenge of like putting all of my energy into trying to appeal to like what would become Trump voters on Facebook. Like it was really exciting when I actually got a post that I felt good about and that they actually enjoyed. And so I do like the challenges of like putting myself into that, you know, brand or news organization, uh, just like I do now with the TikTok Washington Post. So if I, you know, I'm sure one day I'll, be in a position where I can do that more for myself, but I, I do like the collaborative nature of working with other people too. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't have put it any better. I mean, I feel the same way with any project I've done where like I started doing this podcast, like, I don't know, like a year and a half ago or something like that. And it was sort of after the stake of stuff had calmed down a little bit. So I had like some extra energy to put into it. But as soon as like any other work picks up, like in the time that I've done it, like I've picked up a bunch of freelance type work and like I physically cannot exert the amount of energy needed to like make this what it is as, as it was before where it was like basically a weekly podcast because <laughs> it's just not there. Like I don't have the time and if I did it, it would be just less than what I'd want it to be. Like I wouldn't be enjoying it the same way because it's just like stressing my schedule at that point. And, and also, like you said, I mean, if you're going to run something like even with the, the, the stake of TikTok now, I know from personal experience through doing their Twitter that if I'm going to make this any good at all, like I have to pretty much put all like not all my time, but like a substantial part of my schedule into that. So like when I'm home at night thinking of like eating dinner, taking a shower, watching TV, whatever, like when I'm thinking of ideas that just come to me, I'm like putting those ideas toward this project. Like if they were if those ideas were going toward like a personal project, like this would not be half as successful as it was, which mine, you know, Sigma TikTok's not it's not doing numbers yet, but like it's doing okay for like just starting right. out. So like I know to get something off the ground, like you have to put that semi obsessive nature into it, which I think is important and like balancing your your creative energy because you don't it's not it's not an yeah. unlimited thing. So it's it's cool that you're you're aware of that at least. And that's what it comes down to, like in and just in general, like even just just the TikTok account by itself, like just run, just creative energy. 
it's really, I mean, I think more people understand it more now, like even within journalism, like they do understand the creative people in the corner, like need time to recharge and, or just like, we're not going to be on every single day, but it is like you, there is an expectation there and it's really hard to keep that creativity moving forward. Like I've definitely had sort of moments of like, I just, I, I can't really do it today. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, yeah, I was wondering about that. I think we we kind of touched on it earlier. I mean, at this point, because you have been doing them for what, like half a year or like a little over half a year now, right? Yeah, yeah. So you've been doing it for a while, like pretty consistently. I mean, do you feel at any point like the sort of anxiety of like of pressure built up because now you have an expectation of like what it should be? Like, is this something that consumes you at all, or do you do you like manage that pretty well? I I'm getting better at managing it. It, it, There's kind of two factors. There's, there's the expectations I set completely just arbitrary rules I made for myself Mm -hmm. that now other people, uh, as far as I can tell, and they do seem to like abide by it. Like I said, from the very beginning, I'm going to publish Monday through Friday. So at least five and then maybe one or two extra if I have time. And so, and I, and I'm going to do it between noon and two every single day. And so by setting that standard, you know, I, I did sort of like dig myself a little bit of a hole where I was like, Oh, I'm I'm going to have to commit to this. Um, but then, as I mentioned, like I had that Slack group where I have a bunch of people who can throw in random ideas. So I've gotten pretty good at like, having that group there, if I need them, like if it gets to be 10 30 AM and I still don't have an idea, I, there's a number of people in the newsroom who are like all coming from different backgrounds and perspectives who constantly, not constantly, but pretty consistently will have an idea for me ready. So, um, I've learned to deal with it by just basically barring off the creativity of others, which again, it's all collaborative anyway. Um, most of the account is like kind of on my back in terms of all the work that goes in, but I've learned to sort of allow other people to, to you know, bring in the creative juices when I I just don't have them because that's a very natural thing to happen. Yeah, that's super smart. Like, there's been even just the past week alone, like there's been days where I come in to work and I have all these ideas, and then that day I record like four TikToks throughout the day, and then the right. next day I come in and I just have nothing. Like, I couldn't right. think of an idea if my life depended on it. Like, I'm just <laughs> yeah. I'm just done at that point. And then, but yeah, it's, it's so it's cool to have that infrastructure where people are feeding you creativity for when for when you're uh, from when the well is empty, I guess. Yeah. And I, you know, it goes without saying, <clears throat> I didn't mention her by name, but Michelle Jaconi is my, my boss now. It was my, my direct boss and she was my boss at IJ too. So I basically oh, wow. now she's, yeah, she's a, she was the person that when I saw she got the job at the post, she had, she had left IJ a few months before I still had a, you know, a friendship with her. And I was like, can <laughs> I emailed her and she's like, I was about to call you anyway. <laughs> it's like, okay, great. So <laughs> she was my, my in and basically my recommendation, but also, you know, hired me to her team. So basically now I've been, she's been my boss for off and on almost four years. So that that's really important for me too, is that I have someone that I not only do I trust, but that she also knows how I work and she trusts that I will get it done on my own time, which I, which I have. That's so important. It's, it's insane how many social media managers and content creators that I've talked to that work for bigger companies or even smaller companies and just the roadblocks they come into not only between like with the bureaucracy of their company, but just the fact that like their management or their like C level people just don't either they don't believe in them or they don't understand what they're doing. And there's just like no real relationship there that could help, you know, fuel their creativity and keep them wanting to try new things. Cause like if you don't have that environment in place, I mean, you're constantly walking on eggshells. You don't know right. when the right time is to, to push the envelope or to reel back or how much time you should even invest. Cause like they don't even care. So it's like, it's so good to have that in place, that relationship. Yeah. And it's, it's worth pointing out that before Michelle at IJ, cause she wasn't there when I started there, the the guy who originally hired me was great, but he wasn't really in charge of me. And then the person they brought in before Michelle was awful, like truly one of the worst. Mm. <laughs> I'm not going to say I don't like to just call people out. Just it would be vindictive at this point. But like this person was not a good person just yeah, no, outside totally. of the job. And so uh, I I it's good that that happened in retrospect, because now I know what it's like to not have that support. Um, it, like, and I'm basically just reiterating what you said, but like, that is so important to like, just even wanting to come into work every day, even if you like 
enjoy the job you have or or, are very excited about the job you have and the job title. Like it's all about, uh, the people that there are there that are going to make it a good or bad day for you. Yeah, totally. And I'm wondering too, like with the, the management structure there, like, and I'm sure you've had similar conversations with your coworkers or maybe even like at the managerial level, but like, have you talked to any of them about, just like what you think will happen one day when, if and when, I, should, I shouldn't say when, but if and when you leave the post, like having your face so attached to this image, like <laughs> have you thought at all about like what the, the sort of transition or what the the future of this like broader brand looks like now that it's kind of so like cemented itself to, to your face in a way? Um, I've certainly thought about it. I, we, so we, uh, I, the short answer is we have year end evaluations, except they take place in like February mm. because we're a giant company. Um, and I am positive that's going to come up then. Um, I, if I had to guess, uh, the account would kind of, I wouldn't take it with me, but it would, it would probably sort of fizzle out if I was not running it. And that, and that's not to say I wouldn't like if they said, Hey, okay, you're leaving. That's fine. Can you help transition this account? I would love to that. I'd be totally happy to do it, but I don't know. Unfortunately, I've kind of like built my own car to my, like with its own levers. And I built that car around me and it'd be very difficult to like get out of the car and put someone else in that seat. Yeah, so totally. Yeah. And so, and, and I mean, that's sort of the, the one downside of creating something so specific that works is like only you kind of have the touch to make that machine work because you created it. So, uh, which is a fun metaphor, but it's, it's not fun for <laughs> the Washington post if that were to happen. Um, but yeah, I, it hasn't really come up yet. I, I will say, like personally for me, I'm still very happy to post. So not that that's what you're asking, but like I, the part of the reason I don't think about it maybe as much as I should is I just right now like I'm having so much fun and, and the election uh, coming up. I'm gonna get to go to Iowa, New Hampshire. We're gonna that's go to the Super. Yeah, we're gonna and outside of that, we're going to the Super Bowl and the Oscars. Like I get to do all of this stuff like all within the next month, and then even after that. So uh, I'm just I'm excited about that. But uh, it, it is. It's a tricky situation, but I generally everyone's pretty happy. So I mean, what have, I don't know what we're gonna do. No, yeah, and, it, and it's like, what yeah. else can you do? Like you said, yeah. I mean, that's that's part of what kind of comes along with building a personified brand in a way. It would be the same thing if like. I don't know, some other media publication had a YouTube channel and like a program on that channel was specifically centered around one personality. Like when they leave, you could theoretically replace them, but like it's so difficult to not just find the person to train, but like to find someone with the right personality who's, and not even just the right personality, but the right traits that are going to like pick things up to the same standard you left behind. Cause like right. it, I've thought about the same thing with Stakem. It's like if, if the client, came back to me and was like, hey, we're bringing in someone else for this job. We'd love it. And, you know, if you helped like this transition period, I'd be totally down, obviously, to like help train someone to do right. this. But past a certain point, like there is a certain, uh, I guess I'll, I'll say genuine care on my end about the people mm-hmm. that I'm interacting with that either you have that or you don't like either this is a job to you and it's just like this is what you do day in, day out. Like you're you're posting, you're applying or you're like personal with it and that bleeds that usually bleeds through to people like you were talking earlier about just like people on tiktok being able to to sniff out inauthenticity like that's something you can't really teach someone so you got to like find someone who already has that they have like the same work ethic they have the same ocd or they're like trying to get things the way you did them like there's a lot of factors that make it really right. difficult to replace someone that that's done a personified brand image like that. Yeah. And you almost have the instinct to go, Oh, well then like I should help transition this person, but I should tell them to do something completely different because yeah, if you try to, right. yeah. Cause I, I feel like, and this is sort of related. Like I, I love Trevor Noah. I think he's one of the funniest stand up comedians. I think they, I think even hiring him for the daily show was really smart. I think trying to do the same format with Trevor Noah was such a, like a big mistake. Yeah. 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 And, and and I, you know, I've now had like a, a, really the opportunity to, to meet a bunch of people there because of their TikTok account. And like everyone there is so smart and so funny. Like I, I think a lot of people are there that were with Jon Stewart. Like they have all the pieces there, but they're making a show that I don't think they should be making. And so it's just like, it's that it's like they, you, you shouldn't try to replicate it with an entirely different person who like, isn't 
I, I'm just going to repeat myself, but like, it, it's just not the, it's not the right fit in that way. You should just use what you have to make something much better and different. Yeah. Cause you, cause you also bring on the baggage of, of expectation. Like you're not, exactly. you're not going to yeah. fill John Stewart's shoes. Like no matter right. how good or funny you are, I mean, you kind of have to, you know, do something different just for the sake of the audience who's going into it already expecting this, this sort of not even, uh, it's not even like a high, low level. It's just a very specific product that they're now not getting. So, I mean, that, yeah. that's so true. Yeah. Right. And John Stewart, and I, I mean, I wouldn't say there was like drastic differences, but they made, they, they changed it a lot when they took it from Craig Kilborn to John Stewart in like a 99 or whatever that was mm-hmm. like that show had already been around for three years. And then John Stewart came over and they made it something very different and they did it in a much, they made the show better. So like, I, I think it's, obviously following John Stewart's stuff, but uh, you know, we could go down that rabbit hole all day, but I do think that like, it's almost better sometimes just to completely straight change strategy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's I'm, I'm with you, man. It's going to suck when one day you have to, you know, bring on the, the Trevor Noah to the Washington post. It's going to be a <laughs> rough time. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Uh, man, no, you've been you've been uh, great with your time. I, I just looked at yeah. what, what time it was, and I, I appreciate you you hanging sure. in there for all this. Has been fun. Um, do you? I guess we can we can end it with this. I mean, like looking into 2020 at this point, I and mean, I'm still very new to this platform, so I'm still trying to figure out like how relevant it's been to how relevant it's going to get. And I know we can kind of all make like whatever predictions we're going to make just on armchair analysis. But do you have anything that you've been thinking going into this year that you think, uh, that TikTok's going to become like, do you think it's going to become more mainstream? Do you think, uh, other brands or other like media publications are going to join it? Like, do you have it just general thoughts looking into 2020? What do you got? Um, I think if, if, uh, well, there's, there's one big thing. If TikTok ends up basically separate itself from the the China entity. Um, I, I think it'll change a lot as a company, not for the reasons people think. Like, I think obviously there's privacy issues and concerns and all that stuff. But um, I think that their strategy going forward might be very different. They might change the algorithm if it's a U.S.-based company again. And, and so I think that I'm on the lookout for that just happening at, at all. And, and if it does, then I expect they'll probably make just big changes in the app and how it's run. Um, So I can't predict what they'll do, but that's something I'm certainly looking ahead for to see if that happens. Um, In terms of like other brands being on it, I think if TikTok continues as it is, it, it, we talked, I sort of mentioned like policing as a thing, like it's almost community policed on the app. Mm -hmm. I think brands do well that are good at TikTok. And And as far as I can tell, that's still happening. Like TikTok certainly is really good at having these native ads where they have trending hashtags with brands, but like I, they've done a really good job so far of making those trending hashtags work within the the TikTok sort of overall personality and brand. So um, I don't think that like as more companies get on it, it's going to actually change it. I think it's just about um, basically the app continuing to innovate, but also trying to maintain that sort of wholesome image. So I'm excited to see if that sort of sticks around, but uh, it. I, it'll be tough to it'll be tough to to predict every move. What, what do you think is going to happen? No, that's great. I'm 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 with you pretty much on all that. The only, the only thing I've been thinking about recently, just as I've been like spending more time on it, is just how interesting it is that it's getting covered more in the media. Not just right. not just by like the obvious like mate like you know establishment news pieces that are like TikTok privacy issues, like you said, which is kind of an ongoing issue that's being discussed, but more like on the cultural level, like we're seeing more internet culture style reporters like Taylor Lorenz or, mm-hmm. um, the, or, uh, I think, how do, you, how do you say her last name? Calhan Rosenblatt? Is that Rose, how you say Rosenblatt? <laughs> yeah, Rosenblatt. Rosenblatt. That's like, she's great. Like there's uh-huh. a bunch of reporters that are like starting now to get more traction covering mm-hmm. it. So I'm just interested to see like over the next year, if that becomes more of a trend and then we see more direct media attention on it, which would then like kind of potentially elevate it to the point where like with Twitter, like pretty much anything that happens on Twitter is covered in the news because like obviously journalists all hang out on Twitter. So it'll just be interesting to see like if there's any kind of movement there to get more um, eyeballs on the account. Because it does does feel like more, not just like celebrities and brands, but just like more um, like notable people in general are joining it and it feels like it's getting more comfortable in the mainstream than it was like a year ago, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, it's, 
as as crazy and chaotic as as this event is, VidCon is a really good predictor of like the next eight or ten months. Because VidCon last year in June, I wasn't at this most recent VidCon, but what I heard from the at the post reporter who was there is that it was all TikTok. Like YouTube was the wow. YouTube stars were there, but it was like already about TikTok. And so I'm really curious. I am going to go this year in June, and I'm really curious to see what that looks like because it does seem to sort of predict, you know, not far in the future, but enough in the future that like VidCon in June last year was already well on the TikTok train. And that was part of the, that momentum, uh, as we had reporters come back from, from VidCon and talk about it was really important for me in pitching TikTok at the post and keeping it going. And that like, Hey, there, that's all they did VidCon was TikTok. So, uh, I, I think that will be like a really good way to see where TikTok's at in about what, four months. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, It's, it's, it's been very interesting watching a lot of the people who, criticized tiktok or just like made fun of it as a meme or whatever right. like a year ago and now slowly come around to being like sharing them and even joining the platform so that's like it's always interesting watching that shift happen so yeah very sure. cool man yeah do you have any like uh closing stuff you want to either say or like like where you want to take people to your twitter account or anything like that like just any closing bits uh well uh this podcast was brought to you by spam and <laughs> clearly yeah that's my bit uh no i mean yeah just follow follow us on tiktok washington post and you can follow me on twitter at dave jorgensen uh but you know don't follow honky tonk singer dave jorgensen the guy i forget what his twitter is but yeah. uh yeah Absolute follow it yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but really, I, I think, uh, as you said, if you're interested in sort of the behind the scenes, I, I try to do my best to, to, uh, show what's going on with each TikTok every day. And like, I'll, I'll put a thread below that TikTok of behind the scenes or just little tidbits about it. So if that's something you're interested in, definitely follow. It's great, man. You know, I recommend it. It's awesome. Yeah. So, and I'll plug in the, in the show notes, all your links to, to whatever you want. We'll talk about it after, but again, really appreciate the time. It's been super fun. Um, thanks for coming on. Yeah, absolutely. My coffee finally ran out, so uh, <laughs> that's that's how you know our time is up. So <laughs> that's right. Perfect. All right. Thanks, man. See you. No, no problem. Bye.